Number 10, bugs. Bugs were such an issue because it was common in the medieval period, particularly in poorer households, to line the floors with straw. This was mainly to keep the damp away, however it also provided a warm home for bugs and insects. Sometimes nice smelling flowers or herbs were also added to the straw in order to improve the smell of the room, but unfortunately this did nothing to prevent these bugs from breeding and spreading infections through and through. These straw floors caused a lot of problems where they were located in rooms where food was eaten, and food dropped onto the floor was often not cleaned up. Although dogs may have cleaned up some of the droppings, the rest of the food was for rodents and bacteria. These bugs were not only made for the homes and the floors of the houses, but also bedding. Even some people's own bodies and hair made perfect places for them to live. Many people who lived in the Middle Ages were infected with lice, if that doesn't gross you out. When Mary, Queen of Scots, returned to England from France, she was a little offended that the men were still wearing their hats at the dinner table. It was then pointed out to the young queen that this was not a sign of disrespect to her, but a necessity. The men kept their hats on in order to prevent not only their long hair from touching the food, but from the head lice from falling into their plates. That's so gross. Number nine, soaps. <laughs> it's nasty. Number nine, soaps. Some of the wealthiest people in the medieval period may have had access to clean water, though the servants were also called water carriers as they would bring them in to these wealthy people. These were the people that would bring fresh water to the homes for individuals to bathe. If you were poor, as a majority of the people in the period were, you would also have to travel to the nearest river to collect clean water. Although we often stereotype them as incredibly dirty, they were actually very clean back in the day. Soap was actually invented in the ancient Babylonians as early as 2800 BC, and archaeologists have found remains of what they believe to be soap in clay cylinders found at historic sites. Some of these containers had inscriptions like fats boiled in ashes, which was actually a common way of making soap. Egyptians were also said to have bathed regularly, as noted in ancient papyruses found by archaeologists, and this was a medical text produced around 1500 BC, which contained details on how to combine animal and vegetable oils with salt to make soap. Soap. This soap was not only used for washing, but also treating skin conditions. The Romans, like the Greeks, also understood that dirt was causing diseases, and they were famous for building aqueducts to supply their towns with clean water. They also built public baths, as well as cold and hot rooms. Number 8, Dental. Although ancient China, they would use horse hair or even pig hair to make bristles into toothbrushes, it wasn't until the end of the 17th century toothbrushes were actually introduced to England. Prior to this, there was an evidence that people used toothpicks, however most people remained negligent when it came to keeping on top of their oral hygiene. When cavities are formed, they develop decay in one's tooth that appears as holes, and in these times, they call it toothworms, thinking that there might be tiny little worms digging holes into one's teeth. What this indicates to historians is that people in history were concerned with oral hygiene. This is discerned from the simple fact that it was included in texts on general health. Although little was done in terms of preventative measures, some civilizations accidentally and unknowingly improved their dental hygiene. Skeletons of Roman people who resided in Rome showed that they had healthier diets than the rest of the people living in the Roman Empire, which means their teeth were preserved better. Number seven, communal towels. Ugh, this one's so rough. It's exactly what you think it is. It was a ride. Today we have paper towels that you pump like 13 times just to get a little sheet, or sometimes if you're lucky, that Dyson air drying thing where you just dip your hands in for like 13 seconds and then it's done. You're like, oh, the future is here. That's always fun, that one. Back in the Old West, communal towels were often used in public restrooms and other shared spaces. Yeah, just one towel for all. Just a dap off everything that's wet or damp back then, ew. These towels were usually made of cloth and hung on a rack for multiple people to use just in public, like it's your bathroom. While this may seem unhygienic by our modern standards now, it was a common practice at the time, so yeah. I don't know, we can laugh a bit, I guess. People were generally less concerned about the spread of germs and diseases back then, and communal towels were convenient, and they were a cost-effective option for public spaces. However, with the rise of awarenesses about hygiene and germs and all that nasty stuff, the use of these towels eventually fell out of favor in the earliest 20th century. Thank God. Imagine dapping off your lips after eating some wings with a communal towel. Some cowboy just, you know, huh, and then he, huh, and then, huh, 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 and then you come in and wipe your, that's so gross. Number six, toilets. An obvious place to begin when discussing the hygiene practices of our ancestors is with the toilet habits. It was not uncommon for medieval houses to be equipped with closet-like rooms or nooks where people could go and relieve themselves in chamber pots. Some of the richest in the medieval period had, had earlier forms of pipework, which would be transport dirty water and human waste out. Despite these early versions of indoor toilets, people did not always feel inclined to use them. Some records even show that people would do their business at their friend's house in a very dark corner. Nice. 
Even with these times, sometimes you can't even wipe your butt yourself, so you'd hire someone else to do it. Like his personal butt wiper, the groom of stool was a position in the royal household in charge of cleaning, you guessed it, the king's butt. They also had to make sure that the booty was clean and dry, and so they had to wipe down his buttocks with a sponge or a wet nurse and just be a glorified butt washer. They were also responsible for helping him urinate and defecate by providing a wash basin or for them to just use a regular old pot. Number five, eyebrows. We know in ancient Egypt, they were obsessed with their cats, and it's true when a beloved house pet dies, they would shave their eyebrows to show mourning. Unsure why, the eyebrows specifically, but why not? But in some parts of the time, when it comes to your eyebrows, it was essential to look good as eyebrows help form facial expressions and emotions, as well as aesthetics to help form your face. But if your eyebrows did not look fashionable, they were masked by tiny pieces of skin from mice. Although this could have been a satire article used on women and their beauty practices in the 17th and 18th century, there were no tips for applications or storage of mouse skin eyebrows in beauty manuals, but if there was, I don't think they'd publicly admit it. But it would make more sense as a form of critical statement on women's beauty in the 18th century, as they would make fun of the level of aggressions one would take to look beautiful. But there's still more research needed to be done. Number four, lead foundation. It wasn't a surprise when it comes to cosmetics. As a whole, it would take some time before we figured out the right and safe way to ensure beauty doesn't have any long-lasting physical effects. But back in the day, they wanted to experiment and use whatever they could to reduce the blemishes that come with hormones and age. Queen Elizabeth I caked on thick makeup to the extent that it would almost look clown-like in order to hide her smallpox scars. Priests would tell women not to wear makeup because vanity was a sin. However, if a woman was sick and dying, wearing rouge to mask her illness was acceptable. Ceruse was the foundation makeup of choice for both men and women, and gave the most famous smooth, pale look. However, it contained lead that seeped into the body through the skin, leading to poisoning. This makeup also tended to crack and had a very strong odor. Number three, bustles. So while corsets are one nightmare, bustles are just an entirely new thing. Tiny waist wasn't enough, eh? Had to get big old dump trucks as well. These Victorian folks went hard in the paint, figuratively and literally, I guess. Bustles were also known as the Grecian bend. Big old booty bend, that's it. It came to town in the 1870s and it took the idea of wearing a cage as a skirt to just having the back part extend out. Ah yes, an update, an upgrade, I guess. Then the fabric was draped behind the butt. Hope you don't like sitting down ever, because that's obviously not an option. Corsets would move your organs around slowly, and bustles would slowly damage your back. So let's leave this one in the 1800s. I think that's probably for the best. Speaking of hair, knowing bugs and all that were such an issue. In, in ancient Egypt, they would shave their heads not just because of the bugs and lice, but because it was relatively hot. So it makes sense. But to the French, especially the royalty, they never actually cut their hair. There's a story originating from the 6th century in Paris, France, about two princes who were going to descend the throne. They were kidnapped, and the queen consort was given two choices. Allow her grandson's hair to be cut, or let him die with his luscious hair intact. She chose the sword over the scissors. Even during the medieval period, commoners only washed their hair on, on Saturdays, as this was believed that you should wait until the end of the work week to wash off all the sweat and dirt. Now it's more suggested that you wash your hair every day or every other hair depending on the texture of your hair. But interestingly enough, with hair in mind, as well as beauty standards, during the Middle Ages, the, the ideal woman had big hips, small perky boobs, and a large forehead. Since big foreheads were all the rage, women would actually pluck their foreheads in order to get a higher hairline. The goal was to make their face look perfectly oval shaped, so if you got a big old forehead, you gotta let that baby shine. Number one, illnesses. Of course, when it comes to hygienics, we also gotta talk about what they did when one ended up sick with the many trial and errors. In some cases, like for our modern days, it's recommended that we stay home for two weeks. In the 14th century, during the era of the Black Death, Travelers arriving in port would have to wait on their ships for 30 days isolation period. They later realized the incubation period was actually longer, so they raised to 40. The word quarantine actually comes from the term 40 days. This disease formed sores called bulbuses all over the victim's bodies, alongside with aches and fevers and exhaustion. It poisoned the bloodstream and eventually led to their death. They would also hire cat ratchers to kill rats, as they were also known to carry the ticks that would pass along the diseases. Cat ratchers would be used long-handled trays or baskets to scoop up the rodents before they could escape and would also be armed with clubs or sticks just in case they were attacked. They would also kill the rats by bashing and stomping on their heads and then collect them into a sack. At number 10, painting veins. Back in the 17th century in Europe, many people believed that extreme paleness was just the hottest thing. If you looked whiter than a ghost, then you were like the Megan Fox of the town. Many women were obsessed with finding new ways of making themselves look pastier than a white wall, and some of their methods were actually surprisingly creative. The cosmetic skills of women back then were actually pretty impressive, I must say. Wealthy aristocratic women were were the ones who took part in this pale trend the most. They wore dresses with plunging necklines to show off the girls, and they painted themselves white using a powder. 
frankly, this powder made them look pretty artificial, like you could tell that they weren't actually naturally that white. So to solve this, they came up with a new beauty trend, drawing veins. Women would draw veins on their mommy milkers using a blue color to mimic the look of translucent skin. It's crazy to think how far we've come from this, because back then people were trying to look as pale as possible, and now we have people tanning themselves so much that it causes controversy. At number nine, tiny tea. During the Renaissance, fashion and beauty standards were changed drastically from what was popular in the years before. So much in society changed over this period of time, like what was seen as beautiful or desirable. Things like certain body types and other physical attributes had their own trends, but one of the weirdest physical beauty trends from back then had to do with teeth. Back then, the ideal woman had wide hips, a small waist, long legs, and small teeth. Yeah. Teeth had an ideal size. To people back then, the smaller the teeth, the more desirable you were. Why? I don't know, because people are weird, I guess. Some people would even go as far as to file their teeth down to make them smaller so that people would see them as more attractive. Now, I can imagine that this would be a very painful process. Like if you've ever chipped a tooth, then you know that uncomfortable, almost cold sensation of a broken tooth. So imagine that, but on all of your teeth. Yeah, you can count me out. Before we carry on talking about some of these strange things people did to be the belle of the ball, and yeah, there were some really, really weird things, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, nails for days. These days, people get their nails done all the time. I love seeing crazy nail art videos online because they're often so creative. Some of the most fascinating ones are the crazy long nails. I don't think I could ever rock those, but I still admire those who can. The beauty trend of having long nails, though, isn't a new thing. It's been a symbol of beauty and status for many, many years, like years ago in China. Back then, having super long nails was seen as a way to show off your wealth and status. The average nail length amongst Chinese aristocrats was up to 25 centimeters or nearly 10 inches. This was all their natural nails too. And in order to protect their insanely long nails from breaking, they wore nail guards made out of gold. Not only did that protect their nails, but it was also another way of showing off their wealth because not everyone can live their lives wearing gold cages on their fingers. As you could imagine, having nails that long made it so you could barely do anything with your hands, and so that's why these aristocrats had servants, so they could perform the tasks that someone with super long nails couldn't. But would you ever want to have nails that long? Number seven, mouse skins. It honestly seems like we really can't get our eyebrows right. In the early 2000s, they were plucked within an inch of their life. Today, we have brow pencils, waxing, soap brows, which I really don't understand. Back in Elizabethan times, they were plucked entirely off of the face to make foreheads look bigger. And now there's this trend. Eventually, bountiful eyebrows came back into fashion, and for those women who weren't blessed with such brows, resorted to mouse traps. That's right, in order to get that luscious furry frame above their eyes, they would catch mice, skin them, and apply them to their eyes. Yay! In the 17th and 18th century, more specifically, women of nobility were known for shaving off their eyebrows entirely and stick on the mouse skin. It was better if the mice had really dark fur because the popular look of the time was pale skin and black eyebrows. Gee, I wonder where Snow White came from. But even more hilariously, <laughs> They would place their brows higher than normal so they walked around looking surprised all the time. Imagine one of them receiving the worst news possible while simultaneously looking like they just won the lottery. Also, the glue wasn't very good, so they would fall off at leisure. Your mom died. <laughs> oh no! Like what the heck? At number six, tiny tootsies. For many years, having the tiniest feet was seen as a popular beauty trend in China. Foot binding was a big body modification practice in China that began in the 10th century AD. It is said that this whole trend started because a court dancer bound her feet and the emperor at the time, Emperor Li Yu, really liked what he saw and soon it was encouraged for other women to do the same. Soon this practice of foot binding became a huge trend and it became associated with being able to find a husband. The practice of foot binding began when a girl was five or six years old. They would have their feet put in hot water, have their nails cut short, and have their skin rubbed with oil before having their four smallest toes broken, folded over, and tied down. 
Then their feet would be bent in the middle to break the arch, and the girl would have to walk around like that over time, crushing the heel and sole of the foot. After about two years, the foot would be considered ready, and depending on the size of the girl's foot by the end, this would judge how easily she'd be able to be matched with a good husband. This practice continued all the way until the 20th century, where it started to lose popularity. Item number five, long skulls. One of the most bizarre beauty trends from ancient times, at least, was the process of head shaping. This unusual beauty trend caused people in modern times to think that aliens were real when remains were discovered with oddly shaped skulls. Some people believe that we had proven the existence of extraterrestrials, but in reality, it led to the discovery of an entire practice of human body modification for the purpose of beauty. The process of head shaping involves putting some kind of pressure on a baby's head so that it grows into a different shape. This was known to be done by using cloth or even boards to create the desired shape. This is one of the oldest beauty trends in history as the earliest evidence of modified skulls come from Australia and date back between 14,000 and 9,000 years ago. The skulls that were found had flattened foreheads and very prominent brow ridges. This practice also occurred quite often in South America where skulls with a variety of different shapes have also been found. I'm kind of glad that we don't do this anymore because I could not imagine going through life with a cone head. I wonder how it would feel to have a head shaped like that. My neck hurts just thinking about it. Item number four, five head. Let's go back to the Renaissance for a bit to talk about yet another one of their super strange beauty trends. They really had a lot of weird desires when it came to appearances and I'm certainly glad that this next one is no longer in style and I really hope it never makes a comeback. Back in the Renaissance, it was believed that girls with high curved foreheads were the most beautiful, but obviously not everyone can be built like that. As people do, they came up with a way of achieving this look without having to be born with said attributes. In order to have that big forehead that people so desired, women were known to have shaved or plucked the hairs from their natural hairline to make their foreheads look bigger and therefore more desirable. They really said, receding hairline, but make it fashion, I suppose. Number two, finger food. You ever go to somebody's house for dinner and they have like, 15 forks laying in front of you, just way too many utensils for no reason. That's why I like nachos, okay? It's not intimidating. Burgers aren't intimidating. You can just eat with your hands and get messy. It's easier. It's way more fun as well just to dive in and make an absolute mess. Like medieval times, for example, they had cutlery, but you had to be somebody fancy to have it. Most of the population, being poor and all, had to eat with their hands. Chopsticks were first used during the Shang Dynasty, the oldest chopsticks ever found went as far back as 3000 BC. But come 400 AD, China's population spiked, resulting in a lack of resources for food. These stirring sticks now got a lot smaller to fit for their smaller portions, and that was the start of chopsticks. Fun fact. Come the 16th century, the rich and fancy carried their own set of forks with them to their royal dinner. King Charles V of France had a vault, a vault with a few forks in it. He's like, hey, check this one out. Bing. That's how rare that kind of metal work was back in medieval times. I bring plastic forks to work. Does that count for something? I have like two in my backpack, maybe three. Number one, and last but not least, a gong farmer. Adding to that fantasy I spoke about earlier, living in a castle with a glistening, sparkling moat. What moat could you want? Well, I'm sorry to say that moats often doubled as toilets. Very often when castles were built, the toilets would be built high up in the castle hanging over the moat so that it would just drop right in there. But another way they would deal with their droppings was to build a toiletry over a cesspit, kind of like an outhouse, or kind of exactly like an outhouse. Except at one point, the cesspit would fill up, enter the hero of the hour. Today, we have people with machines who do it, Somebody actually had to go in there and do it himself with their bare hands. Friends, remove your hats in honor of the gong farmer. Their job was to get on in there, shovel it out by hand, and ferry it to a spot where they could bury it. It was a dangerous job for a multitude of reasons. The top ones including the pits were often riddled with disease, and they were often quite deep. So as a result, they were paid very well for the time to sweeten the fact that no one would go near them, so they would be forever alone. But even then, lives were lost. One man by the name of Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. What a way to go. Item number two, strange corsets. 
Corsets have been around for a long time. They've come in and out of style, and even right now, corsets seem to be making their way back into mainstream fashion, though maybe not as extreme as back in the day. In the 19th century, having an hourglass figure was seen as the ideal body type, and so in order for many women to achieve this look, they wore corsets to cinch their waists. However, the looks were pretty extreme. Some women tightened their corsets so tight that their waist could be wrapped with two hands. Like, imagine that. Although this was seen as super chic back in the day, it was also causing some health issues because it would squish together people's organs, and as you can imagine, that's not a good thing. Eventually, corsets evolved so that rather than cinch the waist so much, it would just accentuate the hips to still give an hourglass shape without causing too much bodily harm. And finally, at number one, no no piercings. How many of you guys out there have piercings? I have a few myself, I have my ears pierced, and obviously my nose is pierced, but there are so many other places that you can get pierced even in the no-no region. Back in the Victorian era, piercings down under were pretty popular and were considered to be very fashionable amongst wealthy women. Some women would have their nippies pierced and even chained together, and some men would even get their peepees some jewelry too. For women, it was all about trends, but for men back then, many of them got their nether regions pierced supposedly to make wearing tight pants pants more comfortable. This piercing was called the Prince Albert, and it was given that name based on the legend that Prince Albert got his little prince pierced in order to hide the size of his junk underneath his clothes. Whether or not that's actually true is beyond me, but I would imagine that getting that piercing would be painful. Absolutely painful. But remember, in the wise words of Beyonce, pretty hurts. Oh boy, was she right. Number 10, Golden Hair. Hair is important. Imagine how different George Clooney would look if he was balding. Ooh. You gotta take care of your hair. There's nothing like treating your scalp to a nice scented and moisturizing shampoo. The Incas thought this too. And reach for the next best thing. Fermented pee. Oh yes, that's right. Basically, you take a pot, you put some wee in it, and let it sit for a week. Why not? Want to stay smelling fresh, of course. I'm not sure if this would make your hair silky smooth, as I'm not frankly in the market to try this. And this one, I can firmly say that if you try this one at home, stop it. Get some help. Don't do that. We belong in the toilet, not on top of your head. Stop. Number nine, what a crock. As if urine in the hair wasn't enough, this beauty trend comes at you from the Romans and the Greeks. The Romans and the Greeks were the peak of ancient civilizations built beautiful monuments and were honestly just so smart, so smart. So smart that when they saw crocodile dung, they knew right away it had some beauty properties that they just couldn't pass up. They would bathe in crocodile dung. That's right, bathe in crocodile dung. Known for its restorative and anti-aging properties, I'm just not sure how this works really. Did they like heat it up or something or did this like slip into a tub? with a pile of like lukewarm unlawfulness. And how do they really know it had de-aging properties? I'm starting to think this knowledge might be related to the whole urine shampoo thing. This is also gonna be a hard pass for me. No thanks, I'm, I'm good. No, no, no poo in the hair. Number eight, beauty is pain. Ladies, we all know sometimes beauty is pain. It can be a lot or even too much sometimes, but how far are you willing to go for a little extra beauty. In ye olde times, pale skin was considered to be beautiful, but not always the easiest to obtain. Makeup is expensive and was made of lead and other lovely materials. With all that makeup being caked on, that had to feel lovely on your face. So what's the next best thing? Bloodletting, yes, that's right. In order to have that healthy twilight pale look, women found themselves relieving themselves of their blood. Bloodletting was used for other medical reasons at the time as well, but why not get two birds stoned at once? Stay healthy and achieve that beautiful complexion. I unfortunately pass out at the sight of someone else's blood, so the loss of my own just to be pale would not, would not bode well for me. I will have to hard pass on this trend as well. Plus, look at these rosy cheeks. I don't want to lose that. I think it makes me look cute. Number seven, one night with Venus, two years with Mercury. It wasn't too long after humans discovered toe curling that as much fun as that may be, there can be some unfortunate side effects. Knowing somebody in the biblical sense can transmit not so fun diseases if you catch my drift. Like syphilis, early stages being sores and uncomfortable rashes, late stages having much more serious side effects, like blindness, heart disease, and oh yeah, it can make you go crazy. So throughout history, and especially before there was antibiotics, how do you treat a disease so common amongst people participating in the devil's dance? Liquid mercury, yeah. 
People try to treat a disease by consuming liquid mercury. When applied to the skin, it burned. Therefore, if it hurts, it works. It was noted that syphilis would go away after mercury treatments, but this could have just been a stage of the bedroom rodeo disease as its symptoms disappear right before things get bad. This is also assuming that people taking mercury aren't getting sick of mercury poisoning in the first place. This practice continued way longer than it should have as it wasn't until discoveries made in the 1900s that a better option for treating the brothel related illness. Honestly, with this kind of logic, anything's possible. Sky's the limit when you're crazy. Number six, pearly blacks. Here's another beauty trend brought to you by the horrifying things we as human beings can do to a mouth. In Japan, there's a practice called ohaguro, which just translates to blackening of teeth. Japanese women would essentially, over time, dye their teeth black. Another dual purpose, as it was thought to preserve teeth in old age, and was seen as a sign of beauty. Something that separates humans from beasts, or so they thought. The dye itself was similar to some inks, as the process involved dissolving iron, vinegar, and some oils. After this process, a concoction is made that is a non-water soluble and acts like a dye when applied to the teeth. Yet again, as a semi-charming internet host, I am going to pass on this opportunity. Plus. Who am I to judge? Japan has given us lots of fun stuff, lots of great stuff. They're awesome. Mario, Zelda, Little Mac. Basically, I'm a Nintendo nerd, so I can never speak ill of the land of my favorite games. Even if the whole black teeth thing only ended like 150 years ago, which, when you think about it, isn't that long ago. Number five, rationing legs. World War II was a war fought everywhere, and that includes at home. Go ahead and ask your grandparents what it was like. It was only a nickel for a bus ticket, and the movies had newsreels, yes. It's three o'clock and I'm ready for dinner. See, that's what they say. Go ahead and ask them, they'll tell you. Well, okay, Grandma, but on a serious note, people had to ration food for the war effort. They also had to ration other goods that you might not expect, like ladies' nylon stockings. In Britain, nylon stockings were all the rage, but the materials for such were needed for the war effort. So the Gravy Browning Company came up with a bright idea, just paint your stockings on. Some women actually did this, and sometimes would even draw on the seam with an eyebrow pencil just to make it look like the real thing. Ooh. However, I just cannot see this being a great idea. I mean, it rains a lot in Britain. Would it not just wash off? What if I get sweaty running for my bus because I'm late for work? Yup, this is another one I'm just gonna have to pass up on. I'm sure the pain was 100% safe for body application as well. It probably wasn't. Number four, bad hair days. All right, this one is generalizing, but hear me out. When was the last time you thought about haircuts in the past? Yeah, see, you don't. That's because they belong in the past. I'm talking about popular hairstyles from the 1950s to 2000s because honestly, there was a lot of them. And honestly, what were we thinking? We are a species that has left our own planet through science and technology. Yet, we come up with hairstyles like the beehive, the mullet, everything in the 1980s, and the most heinous, atrocious hairstyle ever, frosted tips. Sorry, Guy Fieri. The list goes on, but my point is people fully went out in public with these crazy hairstyles. I, myself, may or may not have sinned and maybe had frosted tips at one point in my life. I maybe had a button up shirt with a blue hot rod flames on it, but I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you the complete truth. After being a part of this trend, I can firmly say I no longer want to participate in any more bad hair days or blue flamed shirts. Number three, the trico system. Instead of plucking your eyebrows before prom or getting waxed head to toe like we commonly do so today, back in the 1920s, you needed the trico system to remove any unwanted hair. This device was booming in the 20s. Hair salons just had to have this machine. I'll call it machine. It was changing the game. By 1925, there were over 75 systems installed in beauty shops. And what you would do is you would sit at this large desk, face a tiny small window, and for a few minutes, you would just be beautiful. Just 20 simple treatments of this radiation beaming off your face and then bam, you're beautiful. What's, what's the trick you ask? Radiation, they didn't know this yet, it was dangerous. They didn't know much at the time, but this thing was chock full of radiation. They used x-ray technology on their bare faces. That's like when you go to the dentist and they click the thing and then they run into another room. This one, they're like, just right there, no sheet, no metal, heavy thing, just face to face, now I'm hot. So in 1929, trico problems were on the rise. Ulcers, carcinoma, keratosis, death, just everything bad. This was not the solution you wanted, but you know what, at least you were hot. Sorry gents, this isn't for you. Number two, my little weight loss friend. Okay, I get it, it makes perfect sense. The numbers add up here, but all I'm gonna say is, 
The Chief knows medicine and he said this is a hard pass for me and it ain't it. If you want to shed that extra winter weight and be beach body ready with minimal effort and still enjoy deep fried chocolate bars, then you have only one thing to do and that is swallow tapeworms. Where a tapeworm will grow inside your body and help eat those unwanted calories. Trouble is you can get very sick and if the tapeworm attaches itself to something that is well, vital for your living, you're going to have a bad time. You'll get sick. Just don't do this one, please. Don't swallow tapeworms, please. Don't do it. Number one, I spy some great complexion. Arsenic cookies. I'm just gonna be blunt with this one. Women were eating arsenic cookies for their complexion. You could straight up just walk into a Sears in 1902 and just buy some. It says it's safe on the box. For people who aren't familiar with arsenic, it's poison. Spies often carry one in pill form to unalive themselves in case of capture. At this time in history, it was no secret what arsenic was. This is just kind of weird, like putting ketchup on your eggs, kind of weird. That's just a joke. We're having a debate here in the office and I'm just curious to see who does that. But back to the poison. It was not safe and over time, with lots of exposure, you can get very sick. It's arsenic, it's poison. Don't do that one either. Why, that's just wrong. Oh man. Number 10, face off. All right, so it's the 1900s, and technology has gotten good since the 1800s. That means a better life for everyone to enjoy. One such advancement was in women's cosmetics. Introducing the Radia, a brand of makeup that's formulated to make you glow, ladies. And if you don't glow, you can't shine. The secret ingredient, radioactive materials. I honestly can't believe that this one is real, but yep, here I am. Yes, their makeup products contain concentrations of radioactive material to give you the facial boost that you need. Tighten the skin, get rid of wrinkles, and literally make you glow. I'm not a doctor, and you probably aren't one either, but I don't think I have to tell you that applying nuclear material to your face every day before work is not a great idea. In fact, it might be a speed running strategy to see how fast you can end up in a hospital for radioactive sickness. I read a report from the chief, who's a nuclear scientist, and he said that's not it. Number 9. Nail Biter There's a short amount of time on the clock. The scores are tied and your favorite team's player steps up to the pitch, plate, or wherever they need to be. Beer sweats began to drip down your face onto a jersey that should have been thrown out two playoffs ago. The nachos and chicken wings that were once plentiful on your coffee table now lay barren with emptiness. This is what most sports fans would call a nail biter. But all Super Bowl predictions aside, is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in ye olde times, trimming their nails. How else but with the set of pearl chompers the Lord hath given you. That's just how people did it. Yes, that's right, they bit their nails off. Which even today is kind of gross. You gotta use the old noggin for a minute and think about how clean people's hands were. No running water, no modern toilet paper, Ooh, stinky. That is not a win-win situation. That is, that's actually a lose-lose situation. Don't do that, that's gross. Number eight, mini brows. Back in ye olde times, pale skin was in, and so was dark eyebrows. How to achieve such a complexion? Well, bloodletting for the skin, but I've gone over that before. Something a little more heinous was committed to make ladies' eyebrows look luscious. Mice, a lady's best friend, right? Yeah. Besides some French rouge and ivory teeth, a common beauty practice was to have mouse furs as eyebrows. This is just wrong on so many levels. Mice are just gross as it is on a regular basis without them being on your face. But my question is, was there like a mouse hunter or like, was there a mouse farm? Or was the buddy just scooping up mice out of the gutters and skinning them and then, uh, here you go, your highness, here's some fresh mice skins. Ooh, yuck, man, no. Number seven, bad toothpaste. Doramad toothpaste was advertised in the 1920s. The ad shows a blonde lady with a lovely smile. Some would even say glowing. Right below reads Doramad radioactive toothpaste. Radioactive toothpaste, I've uh, hmm, that sounds bad. I've played enough fallout to know that radioactive toothpaste probably isn't a great product, especially to put in and around your mouth. It even loudly advertises its radioactive ingredients. Can you imagine this? Increase the defense of teeth and gums. The cells are loaded with new life energy. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. That last one I made up, but you can't tell, right? How insane is this? The secret ingredient to shinier smiles and brighter futures was thorium. The god of thunder does not brush with thorium. He uses it to polish his hammer. Yeah, it's very toxic. Number six, boots with the fur. 
Most of you probably love a good pair of apple bottom jeans and some boots with the fur. But for our Silver Fox audience, they may remember a pair of denim that was more sinister. Bell bottom jeans. Yes, that's right. These pants were wild to say the least. While its origins may be rooted in the Navy and sailors, their rise to fame was during the 60s and the white powder fueled 70s. Remember disco? I know, right? High platform shoes, bell bottoms, and leisure suits. Although I can't lie, I feel like I look pretty good in a leisure suit. Just saying, I don't know. This is just one of those beauty trends that we thought looked good, but in reality looked really strange. I'm sure that'll never happen again though. Not like the trends and fads that we had today will ever go out of style. We'll all be looking back and laughing at the silly things we wore, right? <laughs> oh man, I gotta clean up my closet. Are we still gonna be doing Fortnite dances then? I don't know, we'll see. Number five, a whole lot of man. Well folks, I haven't done much traveling in my time, but it looks like I know where I'm headed next. To the body tribes of Ethiopia. Where, ladies and gentlemen, it's men of my proportions that are most attractive. <laughs> the men of the Bodhi tribe participate in beauty pageants of sorts where the winner is declared a hero and every girl in the village wants to be with the rotund hero. The men isolate themselves away for months at a time with no physical activity. Honestly, for a World of Warcraft player, isn't that hard? Where the men consume a diet that's high in fat to, well, make them fat. What's on the menu? I'm so glad you asked. Well, since the Bodhi tribe has such a great grasp on agriculture, the men drink cow's milk mixed with blood. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that one. After enough consuming of the milkshake from hell, the men's stomachs get fat and the gawking commences. I'm more than just a cut of meat, ladies. You can't just treat me that way. Number four, shark girls. All right, when I was researching this one, I could barely even look at the footage. I was literally cringing in my chair. And this is coming from a guy who likes the Star Wars prequels. Yeah, I know. There's certain women of tribes around the world who have teeth like jaws that are considered beautiful. And I mean the shark, not the James Bond villain. The process of sharpening teeth is quite, uh, well, interesting to say the least, as it's performed by dentists, and I would hardly call them dentists, as they use rocks and chisels to acquire this acquired look. Did I mention there's no anesthesia for this cosmetic surgery? All jokes aside, this is just a lot, and I actually get lightheaded just thinking about it. We gotta move on to the next point before I lose my lunch, or I pass out. Uh. In third place, we have Roman makeup. So the Romans attributed great power to cosmetics. Cosmetics first used in ancient Rome for ritual purposes were just part of daily life. Some fashionable cosmetics, such as those imported from Germany, Gaul, and China, were so expensive that the Lex Opia tried to limit their use in around 189 BCE. These designer brands spawned cheap knockoffs that were sold to poorer women. Working class women could afford the cheaper varieties, but may not have had the time to apply the makeup, as the use of makeup was a time consuming affair because cosmetics needed to be reapplied several times a day due to weather conditions and poor composition. Cosmetics were applied in private, usually in a small room where men did not enter. Cosmete, female slaves that adorned their mistresses, were especially praised for their skills. They would beautify their mistresses with the cultus, the Latin word encompassing makeup, perfume, and jewelry. Scent was also also an important factor of beauty. Women who smelled good were presumed to be healthy. Due to the stench of many of the ingredients used in cosmetics at the time, women often drenched themselves in copious amounts of perfume. Romans believed that the smoke from the burning ambergris would make women more attractive. Ergo, ambergris was typically used in face powders for this reason. Another trick involved sitting over straw fires to make hair shine, or sleeping in a vase filled with red chicken fluid to make it thicker. If that wasn't gross enough, urine was included in facial masks that women used to look clean and beautiful. They also used urine to whiten their teeth as well. Mm, hard pass. Number two, burn it off. In ye olde times, medicine wasn't great. That's no secret. And sometimes these trendy medical practices crossed over into beauty. What do I mean by that? Well, nobody's perfect, right? We've all got bumps, bruises, blemishes, zits, pimples, scars, moles, spots, freckles, skin tags, eye bags, boils, bunions, warts, dark spots, and some emotional damage that a therapist or a bottle of vodka could not fix. However, when people in the olde times needed to remove any of the list I just mentioned, besides the internal suffering that is chronic depression and anxiety, they use hot pokers. No, that's not medicine, but rather the same kind of hot poker that you put in a fire. They were used to burn whatever it was that, well, needed to be burned off. Yes, burned off. While still a medical practice, imagine how beautiful you would feel after your least favorite spot got burned off in excruciating pain and probably causing an infection. Are you ready? Here it comes. I'm gonna do it twice in this list, but I'll let you guys finish it. Are you ready? I spoke to the chief and he said, it's not it. 
it. There you go. Ah, you said it. Let's go. Number one, glowing teeth. Teeth are important. And this is a reminder that you should go to the dentist. Stop putting it off, seriously. Healthy mouth is gorgeous for everyone. So that's why you'd want to use Doramand, a radioactive toothpaste. A what? Yes, a radioactive toothpaste. Coming full circle with the radiation today. This stuff was what it said on the box. And this one literally did say it on the box. It was radioactive toothpaste. Like that was something to brag about or something. I don't need to tell you why that's wrong or unhealthy. You may as well just sit in a room and leave an x-ray machine on all day at that rate. Only minty fresh toothpaste for me, please. Kicking off the list at number 10, skincare routines. For a long time now, having pale skin in Europe meant that you were among the wealthy because in the 17th and 18th century, this suggested you could enjoy the indoors. You didn't get sunburns working outside all day, AKA wealth. Keep in mind, this was long before sunscreen was ever even a thing. So at the time, the best thing to wash your face with was something called chemical wash. That was a mighty wash. This thing packed a punch, that's for sure. This wash would ideally get rid of sunburns, pimples, ringworms, smallpox, scurf, or morphew. I don't even know what scurf is, but it sounds awful. I don't want it. And your skin afterwards would be pale and literally glowing. Thing is, all these foundations were made with old timey, horrible, poisonous recipes. One of these facial creams, I swear, I'm not making it up, was literally this. Steep the lead in a pot of vinegar and rest it in a bed of horse manure for at least three weeks. What? I'm trying to get rid of bags under my eyes. How am I supposed to steep lead? What am I, Walter White? I don't know how to steep lead. I can barely steep tea, let alone lead. Moving on, I'm upset. Number nine, natural or painted. Today the internet is full of makeup tutorials in every corner. Doesn't matter what style you're looking for, help is now available. You can learn how to draw on eyebrows while listening to a true crime story. You know what I'm saying? It's perfect. The makeup game is crazy, but back in the 1800s, you only had two looks to choose from, really. You had the painted look or the natural look. Natural was light on the makeup, more of a paste look than anything, almost like you're a Victorian painting, you know? One of those? But to achieve the lighter look, Europeans would use actual paint, like paint paint. Just lead-based paint. And the most important part of applying this is that you can't smile. You can't even move at all. Any emotion will cause the paint to literally crack. Again, that's why all these paintings are so serious. Madame X, the portrait of Virginie Amélie Avegno Goutreau, originally painted back in 1884. At first, Sargent made the woman's strap slipping off her shoulder. That was a little, you know, scandalous, a little oopsies. That was deemed too scandalous for the upper class society around him back in the 1800s. So John had to literally repaint these straps back on. Yeah, backlash was so strong, John had to move after he sold the painting. The guy left Paris because of spaghetti straps. What a nightmare. But this is what I'm talking about. You start drawing veins on pale skin, people would lose their mind. Love that pale veininess. Number eight, beauty patches. 1800s beauty patches came in many different shapes and sizes. Take this portrait from 1755, for example. Joshua Reynolds painted Charles the Ninth, Lord Cathcart, rocking a pretty large beauty patch. The guy literally looks like the rapper Nelly. That's massive, it looks like a band-aid on his cheek. Whereas other fabrics used in the 18th century were much smaller. There were tiny circles, hearts, stars. If you found this, you'd think somebody was gearing up to go to an Arctic Monkeys concert. They were often used to cover up smallpox scars. They were made out of silk velvet and they were applied with glue. Now the patches were dark black to make the pale pop, but the location of where these went also had purpose. A beauty patch in the corner of your eye meant that you had a lot of passion. On the forehead, that was meant to be majestic. And a dimple patch, oh, well, you're a cheeky one. That's uh, the scandalous one you are. The position of these patches could also determine your political allegiance. Historian Joseph Addison took notes on these positions when observing two parties from the 1800s. One party had patches on the right side of their face and the other had the opposite. That's like switching jerseys back in the 1800s. You're like, ah, this team sucks. Number seven, loin cloths. Okay, I have to adjust the jeans for this one. Going back to ancient Roman and ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Neat. Either that or you would just be naked. So, you know, if you're a nudist, great. Hit the thumbs up if you're a nudist. I don't know. I don't know why I said that. We're gonna keep going. I found this neat step-by-step -step on the internet how to make your own loincloth. And it's a bit more complicated than throwing on sweatshorts and calling it a day. We don't have a lot of archeological evidence today because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time. But ancient Romans would use leather also to make underwear, which is, just imagine that, I'm like, ha, it's hot. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but we'll save that talk for another time. Number six, lip paint. 
Red lips always lie, especially when you don't know that ammonia is mixed in with it. How jolly. Back in the Victorian era, the pale look, red lips, beauty marks, you were trying to look like a literal queen. That was the whole point. So women in the 1800s would either make their own compound themselves, which didn't work, obviously, or if they had some money, they would buy some. The main ingredient in these days were not ideal. Crushed up insects, which already could cause allergic reactions when applied to your lips, but the ammonia mixed in really put the nail in the coffin at that point. Ammonia and crushed bugs? What am I, oogie boogie? What am I making here? What am I applying? Number five, corsets. I can't even imagine how hard it was to wear one of these. Like, I have no chest. I'm just a diving board. And already, this is a nightmare. I can't even imagine. The Victorian corset, okay. <gasps> Tiny waist, curves, look, the whole thing. Obviously, this was horrible for your body. Just looking at this, you're like, ooh. Your ribs would literally slowly deform, as well as your spine misaligning. But instead of talking about how horrible this obvious one was, let's talk about that corset duel from 1836. Yeah, have you heard about this? That's a real thing. Hungarian princess Pauline von Metternich was married to Prince Clemens. She had to marry her uncle when she was 20 back in the 1850s, so surprise, surprise, she was a little unhappy. Weird, right? So since the marriage began, her husband, he was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, whatever. He barely paid any attention to her. That is until, you know, she started to have fun in life. Then he's like, ugh, what are you doing? Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she defied convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess, to a duel and nothing but a corset. How badass is that? To this day, it's not yet determined who won, per se, but a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks? Yeah, that should be a musical. Forget Frozen. I wanna watch this on DVD, let's go. Number four, Deadly Nightshade. Macbeth's soldiers used deadly nightshade to poison their enemies. And during the Victorian age, women would apply nightshade to their eyes, just so they look nice. Awesome, so this is horrible, let's talk about it. The pupils would become larger after this, okay? That was the whole point of putting poison in your eyeballs. The thing that makes deadly nightshade so commonly known is the sweetness of the berries. Have you ever been outside and you see a berry and like 30% of you really wants to eat that berry? Well, curiosity kills. Deadly nightshade can be found in Europe, Asia, and Africa. It grows purple flowers in groups of three, along with those inviting purple berries. Just two to four berries can kill a human being, so don't, when in doubt, just don't eat them. And the flower as well, don't ingest this, you'll get poisoned. And also, don't put any near your eyeballs, in this century or the next. Number three, balding. If you suffer from genetics like balding, maybe some methods of this era can help you. A 17th century publication by Peter Levins gives clear instructions to men on how to cure baldness and thinning hair by making the following mixture. A strong alkaline solution containing potassium salts and chicken droppings to be placed on the area to be treated. In addition, if men wanted to remove unwanted hair from any area of the body, they should make a paste containing eggs, strong vinegar, and cat dung. Once beaten into a paste, this should be placed on the areas where the hair should be removed. I mean, maybe this does help you out, but after going through this suggestion, I don't think you might have the ingredients, let alone use them. I do know now that they do use microblading or tattooing hair that makes it look like hair follicles, so maybe use that. Or just shave it all off. But in the medieval times, having hair was considered a symbol of power, but if you did shave your hair, this was a huge sign of humility. Monks would shave their heads, only leaving a narrow strip of hair, so it might look healthier, or <laughs> so it might be a look either way, just as long as you got your beard. Beards were seen as a sign of honor, and if one man touched another man's beard, this was enough as an insult to challenge them to a duel of death. A lot of rules with hair. Number two, red lead redemption. Look, I'm pretty new to skincare routines, but I'm trying, okay? I'm trying to get rid of these bags under my eyes. I'm trying to sleep and drink water, all that jazz. Back in the 18th century, those bags under your eyes were a lot harder to get rid of. Lead mixed with vinegar, this would make you look more pale. If I used this, I would literally be a ghost. I would just be invisible. I would, you would just hear a voice in a green screen right now. In the 18th century, that pale look was ideal, but this lead vinegar mix also smoothed out your face. So, what could go wrong, right? Queen Elizabeth I used cosmetics containing lead, mercury, and arsenic. Those powerful three things you don't want anywhere near your face. Yeah, arsenic too, the same deadly poison that took out George III and Napoleon Bonaparte. Just the worst ingredients in the 1800s cosmetics game, really. The Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry has arsenic on its priority list of hazardous substances. Toxic metal exposure is still an issue we're facing today in this century, so I hope this is eye-opening. Sans poison eye drops, I hope it's eye-opening. And finally, coming in at number one, deodorant. 
What did people even do before Old Spice? You know, before that guy was born, how did we know how to smell good? What did we know how to do? Deodorant was first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s, and it was called Mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide, and it was stored in metal cold containers. That's just not nothing like speed stick at all. It's not discreet in any way, shape, or form. It wasn't long until the first antiperspirant came along right after it. It was called Everdry, and it was always damp, ironically, and it would always burn your underarms. It literally would eat through your clothes. I think at that point, I'd rather smell bad. Like, let me have rashes, let my face look horrible, let the bags show. I don't, I'd rather do all that than any of this. This is horrible. Number 10, not bathing. Let's start off strong. So obviously hindsight is 2020. We know a lot of, more about personal hygiene now than we did, you know, then and, and as well in like middle school because high school locker rooms, what the heck. Without the knowledge of germs and disease, not bathing seemed like the logical next step for a lot of people, even though it made you smelly as all heck. When the pilgrims arrived in Native America on the Mayflower, the indigenous tribes often referred to their horrid smell. An account from a member of the Patuax Nation even tried to convince them to start washing themselves. They were like, come on guys, it's enough. They washed their hands and faces, but they rarely washed their whole bodies. Though they believed cleanliness was next to godliness, that didn't necessarily mean they needed water to do it. They believed that should they submerge themselves, they risk disease. This could be because they dumped their daily duties into the water, so you know, that's that's likely. So instead they took dry baths where they wiped themselves down with a dry cloth. But this, that, it, it didn't really help much. Number nine, bedpans. It's always the worst when you get tucked in at night, you start to fall asleep, you're starting to doze off, and then you realize you need to pee. It's the worst, you gotta get up, walk down that long scary hallway, blind yourself for two minutes, and then get cozy all over again. Well, in the Middle Ages, you would just toss your full bedpan out the window. Easy peasy, heads up, oh, oops, <laughs> it's so gross. Or sometimes, if you're feeling a little lazy, this was also common, you would use the bedpan and then just slide it back underneath your bed and go right back to sleep. If anybody ever gives you for having cups in your room, show them this video, show them this history. You're fine, you're not that bad. Back in those days, we weren't exactly aware of the disease that we threw out the window as well. Most of the time it was number one, so the rain could just, you know, wash away the yuck. But these buildings were only one story. There wasn't, it wasn't going anywhere. If you were tossing anything out, you'd be stepping over it the next morning on the way to, you know, the public execution or whatever. Number eight, a lead facial. Today, if you have tan skin from that hot summer glow, it implies that you have had enough leisure time to acquire such a hue. Getting a tan is the thing, unless you're like me and slather on that sunscreen for health and so you look like a newborn baby when you're 80 years old. However, it was the opposite in times of old. If you had sun-kissed skin, that meant you worked hard in the fields, a symbol that you were a peasant or of lower class. If you were rich, you tended to have much paler skin, therefore implying your status. But simply staying out of the sun wasn't enough. Elizabeth I used a combination of lead and vinegar to achieve a bright white complexion and to hide her smallpox scars. The compound was called ceruse. This tradition even goes all the way back to women in the Roman Empire. Empire. A well known actress named Kitty Fisher was also said to have died from the material as it slowly poisoned her with daily use. The material would add blisters, so she'd put more on to cover it up. Same with Elizabeth, and yes, yeah, slowly you understand. In seventh place, we have arsenic. Who to achieve that very trendy near death look in Edwardian times, women would swallow arsenic in small portions to keep them super skinny and supposedly attractive. Heck, even Sears sold arsenic wafers for convenience. Deadly diseases were just that popular, and some folks even caught tuberculosis just for the beauty aspects which my brain hurts saying that, not gonna lie. Arsenic invaded almost every aspect of life in 19th century Britain, leaving a toll of death and illness. But most of the fatalities from arsenic were more pedestrian. From accidental use in food or from exposure to compounds in consumer goods such as fabric dyes and wallpapers, in facilities that made these products, and in the polluted air. Now Victorians were just as obsessed with their bodies as we are, if not more dangerously, if you can believe that. Many women used arsenic to fight wrinkles, and men swallowed arsenic tablets as kind of a pre... Uh... Now it's unclear if arsenic can actually be used to uh, turn compasses to the north, but I wouldn't recommend trying it. I think there's safer ways. Number six, wigs and makeup. When you don't bathe and are overall just smelly, you're gonna need to do something to cover up whatever the heck is building up beneath that 
bodice. Wigs would have never become as popular if it weren't for a very specific venereal disease called syphilis. By 1580, the STD was the worst epidemic since the Black Death. Patients clogged hospitals and without antibiotics or protection, things got pretty nasty. Sores, blindness, rashes, dementia, and patchy hair loss. Thus, for the sake of keeping up appearances, wigs came into fashion. Also the makeup I mentioned before. Balding was a huge humiliation, so they made wigs out of horse, goat, and or human hair. They also covered the wigs in powdered scented with lavender or orange to hide any foul odors, and as we suspect, there were a lot of foul odors. They weren't stylish until 1655 when the King of France started losing his hair and had 48 wigs made. Then five years later his cousin Charles II of England joined the train and suddenly powdered wigs became like the next best thing. Wigs did help curb the lice problem though because the human hair had to be shaved in order for the perukes to be worn, but the wigs themselves had to be deloused often. And yeah. Number five. Urine deep. Turns out we used pee for a lot of things back in the day, and today we still do? Question mark? The Romans used urine to wash their clothes, and even more impressive, slash gross, is the fact that they used urine to help with inflammation, burns, or skin disease. Yeah, pee was the number one trick. Get it, number one? I, okay, we'll move on. Best way to whiten that smile was not a crest white strip, but rather a facial mask dip, dipped, dipped in the mellow yellow. Just pee. Because it's so gross. We mentioned on this channel before that gladiator sweat was once bottled and then sold. Well, their pee as well was sold as this beauty product. Clean out those pores with a drop of Igor. Mm. Get it while it's hot, folks. This is extremely gross, obviously, but it does make sense. The ammonia in urine kicks stains away for good. That's why they would wash their clothes in the same way. Now we get it. History. Gross. Uh, number four, rush plants. Today we use chic shag carpets that, you know, really tie the room together. Sips white Russian. But back in the olden times, they used something called the rush plant to pad their floors. But the thing was, this layer of dense plant material was a breeding ground for nits, ticks, and other creepy crawlies. It was it was a really unsanitary situation, but well, like what else were you supposed to do? However, this kind of flooring made them vulnerable to disease and infection. The reason being, as these floors would not be renewed for sometimes 20 years. The bottom layer, left undisturbed, would accumulate a lot of really gross stuff like uh, animal droppings, feces, the piece of grizzle you dropped that one time, fish craps, whatever. So um, it was just not, it was like basically a swamp down there. In third place, we have fire treatment. A trend that swept China is called Huo Liao, which translates to fire treatment. So a towel soaked with alcohol and medicinal herbs is placed on the face or other body parts that need toning and tightening, and then lit on fire for several seconds. Now, allegedly, this invigorates the skin and helps to reduce sagging and wrinkles. It's relatively safe, since apparently the flame doesn't burn long enough to cause serious damage. So I have some friends who do sideshow performing, and do quite a few fire fun things. So maybe this is how they stay looking so attractive? Consider my mind boggled by this concept. Like, is Botox out of fashion or something? I haven't had any work done personally, but this just scares the bejeebus out of me. Number two, eagle dung. I'm honestly not even sure what to say about this, you know? You have to have some kind of magnificent conviction to be like, I have no reason to believe this is true, but I am 110% sure that bird dung will fix it. Like that's some kind of confidence I don't think I'm ever gonna get. Eagle dung was a common substance found in the birthing room of all places. It was often rubbed in to alleviate the pain, most often accompanied by rose water because who wants to smell that while well, they're bringing life to the world? No one, obviously. Obviously that didn't work and the bacteria from the stuff probably didn't help their recovery either. They also used to place amulets and charms on the stomach to speed contractions and put coriander on the thighs. Coriander was believed to attract the baby out of the womb. A risky move considering people either love or hate coriander. There's no in between. It either tastes like soap or it's the best thing you've ever had. If the delivery was proving difficult, they would open covered doors, untie hair, and perform other metaphors to help the mother deliver easier. But it's the eagle dung that really gets me here, folks. I, I have no I have no excuse for them. Number one, the dirty dead. What feels like a never ending maze, the catacombs under Paris stretch for hundreds of miles. They're a big tourist attraction, obviously, today. Horror movies have been made about these catacombs, just these walls of skulls. But where did they come from? Why were they put there? Also, how bad was that smell? 
See, originally the tunnels were built for Paris stone mines, but near the end of the 18th century, its purpose started to shift. Cemeteries were starting to pile up, and I mean that in a literal sense, disgusting. There was nowhere to put all these bodies, and everybody else started to get sick because of them, because they were breathing in, you know, dad corpse hot dog breath. They didn't quite know how to handle the dead in a clean way, so they just wanted these bodies out of sight and out of mind. So all these dead bodies that were laying in alleys or on the side of the road, they were gathered and then tossed under the city in these tunnels. These tunnels have been there for centuries before them, so you might as well put them to good use. And by good use, I mean let's just stack skulls in an orderly fashion and terrorize civilians for centuries to come. Beautiful. Number 10, Long Neck. Look, this one probably isn't a surprise to anyone. There must be like 20 documentaries on the subject alone, but today we're talking about the long-necked women found in some African cultures. In a nutshell, you pile on gold rings around your wife's neck until she's impersonating a totally winnable ring toss game at the county fair. The end result is a neck that's long just as the day is long. Pretty long. And in these cultures, this is considered very beautiful. Now, who am I to judge? I can't. However, as a lawyer, doctor, detective, and fireman here at Bumblebee, I'm gonna not recommend the giraffe look. While at first glance it may look like the neck is being stretched, it's really the shoulders that are being dropped forcibly by having so many rings piled up on your neck. That's just that's not healthy for you. Anyone in the comment section that has played contact sport will tell you that dropping your shoulders like that is not good. I like my thick neck the way it is, thank you very much. Number 9, Lead Cosmetics. Did anyone know we still sort of do this today? Are we insane? Lead has been used in makeup for an extremely long time. It was found in cosmetics back in classical antiquity, so that's as far back as the 8th century BC. In the 18th century though, women would mix lead with vinegar to make themselves look more and more pale, which was a beauty standard back in the day. Gotta love looking like you never see the sun. Now, while the white lead that was used wasn't easily absorbed through the skin, the mixture of white lead with other chemicals and ingredients to create makeup and other products did indeed cause lead poisoning. And even though people knew this, they continued to keep on using it? Number 8. Jiggle Machines Oh, the great effort people will go to not make any effort. The self-exercisers or vibration machines were a popular fad back in the 1950s and 60s. The idea? Lose weight fast and easy with the help of modern science and machines. Trouble is, they, they don't really work at all. In a way, it's pretty similar to the snake oil men of the past. A common issue, a weird solution, and then a great marketing, well, that would make for a fad. Someone had to just make bank on it, I know they did. I mean, I get the appeal, I, I do. I wish I could be a 1950s housewife with a vibration machine, so I could be beach ready. But being a 1950s housewife means I'm so busy. But with a belt machine, it means I can keep my hands free, so I can reach for my favorite brand of menthol cigarettes and my third morning martini. Boy, I sure love this modern world. <sighs> wow. <laughs> Number seven, corn goddess. I like corn just as much as the next guy. Roasted, boiled, and on the cob. Slap some salted butter on that bad boy, whoo, it's time to dig in. Make sure you got the corn on the cob holders though. The little metal thingies that you'll probably end up stabbing yourself with later, that's just, that's just how it goes. Besides backyard summer barbecues, corn was an important staple of the Aztecs. So important that they had a festival to honor the corn goddess. Which to me is kind of a lame thing to be a god of, but alright, let's run with it. Zilonan Festival had the women let their hair loose and green corn placed in it to honor the god, the corn god. A forced female volunteer was dressed as the goddess and after many days of what I'm assuming is eating and worshipping corn, the forced volunteer was sacrificed by the people to once again honor the corn god. You'd think a bowl of corn would do the job, but no, she's got a lust for blood so that means uh, off with it. Number 6, Hangover Mask. Okay, picture this. It's 1946. WW2 is over. Life's getting back to normal. You live in a major city, so you decide to take a night on the town with your friends. Well, one too many Manhattans later, and, well, you're not even sure if you're still on the island of Manhattan. You have what the drinkers of the world call a hangover. Let me know in the comments without too much grim detail about your worst hangover. What was your poison of choice? I'm curious. Many men and ladies have found themselves in bad places in the morning after uh, so many drinks. Only if there was something to cure said hangover. Well ladies, you're in luck. The hangover mask aims to cure that. It's basically just a mask with plastic ice cubes. However, I'm going to get a little personal and say that every hangover I've ever had, I didn't need a face mask. I needed some water. 
and a bucket since the bathroom was too far away. I don't, I don't know why your, would your face need to be cold? I don't really understand that part. I don't know. Number five, tooth removal. Here, I found this quote from a dentist in the medieval period who would travel from town to town. Take some newts, buy some cold lizards, and those nasty beetles which are found in fens during the summertime. Calcine them in an iron pot and make a powder thereof. Wet the forefinger of the right hand, insert it in the powder, and apply to the tooth frequently, refraining from spitting it off. When the tooth will fall away without pain, it is proven. Hey, if it is proven, who am I to say otherwise? Just some lowly YouTube post. If you weren't using your Newton beetle powder to remove your tooth, then it looks like you're going the much more old fashioned tooth pulling route. And that was much, much worse. They had rudimentary anesthetics that was possibly used then, but you had to worry about bleeding and infection. I think I'll stick with my uh, beetle newt powder. Number four, rejuvenique mask. I got another mask for you guys, I know, but I saw this and I, I just didn't know what to think, honestly. It's a mask that you wear, but it's plugged into a battery pack and it sends pulsations to your face. After, of course, you've applied the toning gel. What the heck is toning gel? I don't know. This is supposed to tone your face, apparently. Your jawline, or I just feel like plunging your face into a mask that's hooked up to a voltage. Uh, that's, a, that's just a bad idea. Oh, yeah, and also a bad idea is the mask itself. Look at this thing. I mean, th that's a heinous looking mask right there. You can come home from school one day, and your mom's gonna be sitting at the kitchen table looking up Michael Myers. Oh, that's not okay. Please don't do horror movie beauty stuff, ladies. Please, no. I don't wanna be scared. I don't like scary stuff. Number three, hair removal trick. In the late 19th century, something called thallium actate started to sweep the nation. It was a hair removal method, which even today is the talk of the town. Laser off that peach buzz for good. Zero. Gone. Thallium was used back in the day, but originally thallium was prescribed for those who suffered with ringworm. But even so, thallium didn't do anything per se about the ringworm, it just caused the patient's hair to fall off. So the ringworm was then easier to find. I'd prefer a haircut if you ask me, but sure. Thallium does the trick as well. Eventually, thallium was sold as a cream, a toxic cream. It should never touch your skin at all, and it's a face cream. Are you kidding? This thing was once rat poison as well, and now we're rubbing it around like it's Bath and Body Works Noel cream. It's my favorite cream, the green one. Oh God, gone in two days. This was outlawed, thankfully, in the 30s, but it had to get bad pretty first. Number two, sharp teeth. I like Shark Boy and Lava Girl just as much as the next guy. However, that doesn't mean I want to look and feel like a shark. This one just creeps me out. I, I, I don't hate the dentist, but I think everyone can agree with me that teeth getting drilled is just uncomfortable. It just kind of sucks. Especially if there's like powdered tooth in your mouth. That's just the worst. It's kind of gross too. I don't know. Well, what I do know, however, is that there are some cultures out there where the ladies get their teeth sharpened or filed. Oh yes, and there ain't no dentist office there either. This is bite the leather, you're in dad's kitchen kind of operation. Oh God. I would honestly talk more about it, but the editor's gonna show some pictures and I'm gonna have to stop because if I see them, I would get queasy. I don't wanna see that stuff. I, <laughs> no thank you, no teeth sharp. No, no. Number one, mercury laced skin cream. Secure Gorad's Oriental Cream and take your first step to a new lasting beauty. That's right, over time you too can develop dark rings around your eyes, lose some of those pearly whites, and get stunning black gums. That's because Gorad's Oriental Cream is made with calomel. What is calomel I hear you ask? It's a mercury compound. Yeah, it doesn't sound so good anymore, does it? While the woman of the 1920s who used this product maybe once or twice would be fine, those who used it over long periods of time subjected themselves to mercury poisoning. But hey, Gorad's cream came in white, flesh, and whatever the hell color Rachel is supposed to be. Kicking off the list at number 10, medieval manicures. You can clip your toenails anywhere you want these days. An alarming amount of people do it on airplanes, apparently. Yuck, but how did we clip those little piggies back in the day? Before modern fingernail clippers were patented in 1875, we have to look to the ancient Romans and how they got rid of those hangnails. Biting them off, of course, that was the best way. That bad habit I'm sure half of you have, as well as me. That was the best way, boink. Eating the, eating the nails, bad, bad stuff. In 35 BC, biting nails was written as a way of dealing with nervousness. 
Even back then, anxiety still had, it was a thing, of course. Ancient Greeks had a tool that looked a lot like toenail clippers, but it was actually used for pulling hairs. I'll get into that one a little bit later. It's a bit more intense. Medieval methods for cutting your nails were usually to use a small knife, so around the Babylonian age, the newly invented scissors would just do the trick as well. You just gotta have really good aim. They're big, rusty, giant, comedically big scissors almost. Sandpaper was also commonly used as well, and to that, I say, great idea. We still use that today. Number nine, hot pokers. Okay, I absolutely hate this so much. It makes me cringe, and it will probably do the same to you. No wonder people are actually afraid of going to the doctors. Their ancestors had good reason to be. It was pretty much comparable to going to a torture clinic. Yeah. Though I have to say there was some sense behind this one. If you were to receive an injury where the loss of blood could be fatal, cauterizing the wound was a good way to stop it. But it would definitely suck. They would heat up a hot poker and apply it directly to the wound without the luxury of any painkillers. Obviously, this would be extremely painful. Would I rather bleed out? Or have this done? I honestly don't know. However, it would probably result in infection if not treated properly, especially considering that they didn't wash their damn hands as we found out in the previous video. But they wouldn't just use hot pokers for blood wounds, they would also use them to burn off hemorrhoids and STDs and I don't know, hopes and dreams. It was a bad time. Number eight, clamshell hair removal. Whoo, here we go. Nowadays you can laser off any unwanted hair. Waxing as well, sounds like an absolute nightmare, but compared to how it used to be done, it's still our best method today. Looking back to around 100,000 years ago, long before Gillette had their nine blade razors with cooling gels and all that good shit, we had to use seashells, literal seashells. And when I say seashells, I don't mean they would glide across the skin and, you know, Sweeney Todd themselves. No, they would use two shells and then put them together as tweezers and pluck the hairs out one by one. Seashells. Can you hear that? It's the sound of our ancestors plucking their eyebrows. They're still screaming. Sharpened clam shells were used later in the 19th century and we realized if they're flat enough, we can swipe them off. So they were sharpening shells. Eventually they got to the gliding technique. Saves time, but still it was horrible. And if that sounds bad, 30,000 years ago, we used flint blades to shave. Yeah, just remember, when you nick yourself, it can always be better. At number seven, long neck style. In many cultures around the world and for many years, having a long neck was considered beautiful, and so many women practice neck stretching in order to attain this level of beauty. This practice of neck stretching has been most commonly done by wearing metal rings around the neck, adding more and more rings over time. This practice was first seen sometime around the 11th century in Southeast Asia. The theory behind the rings is that they're so thick that they push the head up, therefore stretching the neck, but in actuality, the lengthening of the neck is caused by the rings pushing down on the collarbones. The origin of this practice is pretty much unknown, but it is theorized that it began as a way to make women look more attractive in order to prevent getting captured as slaves. But on the other hand, some people believe that this was a way of protecting people from getting attacked by tigers. Two very different theories, but nonetheless valid. Though this practice began so long ago, it is still a traditional body modification in some parts of the world to this day. Number six, horsehair dental floss. Yeehaw! Okay, despite how annoying dentists can be sometimes, flosses is vital when it comes to mouth cleanliness. But using horses' hairs to do so, that just sounds counterproductive, no? Early human remains were studied and it showed these grooves in between their teeth. So they would sharpen these little sticks on both sides or use horse hair to get those hard to reach places. Even back then, way in ancient times, if it wasn't horse hair, it was thin, long twigs. Honestly, I'd rather use the twigs. At least that has like a scent of some sort. I don't know, like mint, minto green, something like that, horse back? No. It really wasn't until 1815 until a New Orleans dentist named Levi Spear started to use silk thread to floss in between the teeth instead of hair. Thank you, Levi. As fun as horse hair flossing sounds, I'm going to stick to the spearmint. S spearmint. Levi Spear. Wait a minute. Number five. Crocodile done the deed. Again, I'm saying this again. Who had the gall? Who had the damn audacity to look at a steaming pile of, of digested animal excrement and go, you know, that will work for insert problem here. Once again, I put the question, how the heck did we survive? But nevertheless, we are here once again to bring to you yet another animal poop cure-all, and this time it was for contraception. Yes, in ancient Egypt, women would use crocodile dung as a contraceptive. 
Yay! Now, crocodiles were worshipped and sacred to the ancient Egyptians, so that could be one reason why they thought it would help. They would mix it with sour milk, sour milk, <sighs> to make it a pasty kind of poop dough with a hope that would create an acidic barrier to sperm. Kind of like a dungy version of a diaphragm or a cap used today, but covered in spermicide. We had to start somewhere, but I honestly can't think of a better way to kill the mood. Hold on, honey. Gotta shove some poop out there. Number four, sulfur for freckles. Ooh, this next one gets me hot. This next one is, hits too close to home. Sorry, frecklers. I love my freckles. Every summer they pop harder and harder, better, faster, and stronger. I love them. But back in the day, there were some pretty insane methods to get rid of them. I know, get rid of them. How could you, right? How dare you? Having freckles in ancient Roman days meant you couldn't participate in your favorite magical rituals. <laughs> Yeah, sorry Balthazar, I'll catch the next meeting, I guess. I'm gonna go wash up. Having freckles meant you were impure or polluted. And in ancient Greece, having a beauty mark or a thousand on your face or cheek meant a bright future was in store for you. So, depends really where I am, but kinda, I'm like, huh? Medieval Europe, moles or freckles meant that you were for sure a witch. Great. That one, they're kinda, they're, they're onto something a little bit. I got witchy vibes. Ancient China, if you had a red or black mole, that was actually a good sign, but a brown mole, like this one, meant grave warning signs. E. So depending where and when you were, that freckle that you named when you were seven could have possibly changed your entire life. In places where freckles weren't desirable, sulfur was used daily to get rid of them. We don't recommend lathering your face with sulfur. In fact, I think magical rituals are safer. Number three, Versailles and other palaces. Did anyone else imagine when they were a kid that they were born in the wrong era and should have been like prouncing around in golden embroidered gowns and palaces or being in a masquerade decked in velvet across the room from your secret lover? <sighs> Some more than most. Except there is a lot missing from that fantasy, specifically the smell. You'd think a place like Versailles with like halls of mirrors and lots of gold everywhere would be like the cleanest place to live in the 18th century, but the reality was stomach churning. Remember that red velvet dress? Well that hadn't been washed in god knows how long and you were stuffed in a room with people wearing the same thing and everywhere was a toilet. That's right, nobles didn't wait to empty themselves in a chamber pot or bathroom of some kind. Versailles was their toilet. They would relieve themselves in empty fire pits, imagine if it was occupied, in the stairwell, behind doors, wherever they felt. Sounds too ridiculous to be true? Well, take this 1675 report of the Louvre Palace in Paris and I quote, on the grand staircases, behind the doors, and almost everywhere one sees, there are a mass of excrement, one smells a thousand unbearable stenches caused by calls of nature, which everyone goes to do there every day." Unquote. Things got so bad in other palaces, Henry VIII even had to decree that cooks in the royal kitchen were forbidden to work naked. Why were they working naked? I don't know. Or in garments of such vileness as they do. So as for my first point, I think I was born in precisely the right era. At number three, feet painting. Now you would think that all of the super bizarre beauty trends of the past were from way back in the day, but you would be mistaken. We saw some strange practices in the 20th century as well, especially during war times. Back in World War II, a shortage of silk and nylon in America created a bizarre beauty trend. Because these materials were needed to make things like parachutes and uniforms for troops, tights were quickly disappearing from stores. Because this was such a huge staple in women's fashion, they got creative and created a beauty trend where women would draw pantyhose arrows in their legs, dye them with different colors, and try and mimic the look of mesh tights to create an illusion close to wearing stockings. I feel like if this happened in today's time, I don't think I would be that desperate to do that, and you couldn't catch me drawing or dyeing my legs for this. I think I'll just stick to wearing pants. All right, so let's start off with Venetian Ceruse. It's easy to recognize even if the name isn't. It's that thick white lead powder biddies used to whack on their face, cement thick. Something they've been doing since ancient Roman times. Queen Elizabeth I was known for her iconic white makeup. The Venetian Ceruse made up of white, lead, and vinegar, and applied to achieve a pale, smooth complexion that signified wealth. The beauty ideals 
at the time included bright wide set eyes, snow white skin, rosy cheeks and lips, and fair hair. Elizabeth I was known to use ceruse to hide her smallpox scars, and ceruse became so commonly used by many fashionable aristocratic women during the era. Yet the toxic effects of lead absorbed into the skin didn't go unnoticed in that time either. And it's hard to when your skin becomes grayish and shriveled, and your face hair falls out, and your teeth start eroding away. Not subtle. So, because the makeup ate at the skin, the skin needed to be hidden more, with more makeup. In addition to ceruse, the beauty regime also included a face wash with eggshells, alum, mercury, and honey. The mercury also eating away at the skin, and the eggshells causing micro abrasions to make that all the easier. In the 1700s, a famous beauty and aristocrat from Ireland died from lead poisoning due to her use of ceruse, or what was called death by vanity, Maria Coventry, Countess of Coventry. Its name is beautiful and has the same cloying sweetness and smell as its poison, Belladonna, aka Dudley Nightshade. This is the patron flower of one of my closest friends, so girl, this is for you. According to the Big Bad Book of Botany, the world's most fascinating flora by Michael Largo, a trop of Belladonna's poisonous extracts were historically used by assassins to kill their targets and by women to dilate their pupils to look more seductive. The roots are the most potent part of the plant, but even one leaf can be fatal when ingested or exposed to. Yet Italian women who called it Belladonna used deadly nightshade as an eye drop to dilate their pupils, which supposedly made them more attractive, or at least made them look like an anime character. Naturally, some poison in your eyeball can cause visual distortion and sensitivity to light, and if taken systematically, can kill you pretty quickly. In the mood for a snack, how about some toxic dust pressurized into a cracker? Arsenic wafers. It's exactly what they were too, so if you didn't pop into your mouth whole, that thing would have the crumbling power of a Nature Valley granola bar. Sold under the brand name Dr. James P. Campbell Safe Arsenic Wafers, the fact he put the word safe in there, you know, dicey. In the United States and Europe, these were little white chalk wafers that could treat a variety of complexion problems, such as skin tags, moles, freckles, pimples, blemishes, and also advertised to cause pale skin, which was oh so glassy. In fact, the consumptive chic, aka dying from deadly disease chic, became an ideal beauty standard during the Victorian era, as victims of tuberculosis would become sickly pale and thin. Rich people saw that on the street and said, oh, I think I might steal that look. However, the way that arsenic worked was by destroying red blood cells, and thanks to the toxicity of arsenic, it could also cause symptoms like damage to the kidney and nervous system, hair loss, and skin lesions called arsenic keratosis. The wafers were marketed as being safe, naturally, and while tolerance to arsenic can be built up in small amounts, arsenic is one of the most toxic substances with a median le lethal dose of 13 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. To build an immunity would take scientific precision, not snacking on poison crackers you fish out of your purse. Number 7. Thirsty after a trip to the public washrooms, you may need a drink of water to rehydrate yourself. I mean, come on. I know I could do some hydration after that. Sometimes it gets really sweaty in there. Well, it's a good thing that the Aztec cities had canals, and not just the kind of canals a small Italian gentleman derives a boat through on Valentine's Day, but canals that handled both transportation and irrigation. Aztecs knew just how important water was for life, but perhaps most unusual about the Aztecs is their night soil collectors, which honestly sounds like it's hiding something just in that name. Night soil. Basically, they were beta garbage collectors who used canoes to transport this night soil to farms for fertilizer. And yes, night soil is exactly what you think it is. Poop! But it's unusual for a civilization to be so conscious of where their waste goes. Don't believe me? Well, how about this summer? We all get together, we all go up to New York City and take a dip in the Hudson River. Yeah, not many takers, didn't think so. They were doing their best with what they had. And if women don't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. You know what I'm saying? Nothing like a beautifier that makes you into a terrifier. Gurad's Oriental Cream. Bonus points for that dicey name. All right, so it's the 1920s, and there's a popular beauty cream called Rad's. And it's been on the market for decades, regardless of the horror stories you'd hear endlessly about it from all your girls. It constantly caused mercury poisoning from the calomel compound in it, which was no picnic to go through. Then, party on, you would develop dark rings around your eyes 
and neck, get bluish black gums that were jiggly like jelly, and lose teeth before dying from organ failure. Though women could wear the cream once or twice without ill effects, over time that definitely changed. But as mentioned, it was one of the products that just stayed on the shelves. The cream was available for decades, but the FDA started to regulate cosmetics in 1938 thanks to the Roosevelt's at the House of Horrors event. Calomel was no longer allowed, which means I'll never experience a magic of a mercury filled makeup or figure out what the color Rachel cream was supposed to be for this brand. Become skinny by inviting a parasitic man eating worm into your body? It's the tapeworm diet. And since this is still around today, despite being illegal, I want to take a moment and say your body is genuinely beautiful and there are thousands of other options before this choice. So the idea is simple and gross. You take a pill containing a tapeworm egg and once attached, the parasite grows inside of the host, ingesting part of whatever the host eats. In theory, this enables the dieter to simultaneously lose weight and eat without worrying about calorie intake. Uh, wrong. Tapeworms take hold in various parts of the body and also grow large in size, resulting in blockage in organs and potentially even death. So it's not like it's just vibing out in your stomach forever unnecessarily. Having started in the 1900s, this trend was the result of the whole 16 inch waist BS that made women break their bodies with corsets. This was an era of beauty equaling sacrifice, and sacrifices were most certainly made once the desired weight was achieved. To get rid of the now unnecessary parasite, dieters would employ the same methods as those unwillingly afflicted by the worms. In Victorian England, this included pills or special devices. One such invention, created by Dr. Myers Shelfield, attempted to lure the tapeworm by inserting a cylinder of food up the digestive tract. It comes as no surprise that many patients choked to death before the tapeworm was ever successfully removed. Some people still attempt this diet. In 2013, Today Magazine reported a woman in Iowa bought a tapeworm online, swallowed it, and then had to go to a doctor for help. This trend wouldn't exist if society could get its crap together, which is skin bleaching. The issue of colorism and favoritism towards lighter skin has created a decimating global empire today worth more than 8 billion, profiting off of discrimination in today's beauty standards, and predicted to be 12.7 billion on the black market by 2027. This is made painfully obvious by literally every beauty trend we've discussed so far, and that we've covered in every video about beauty. Their goals are to be pale, pale, pale since the time of the Biazetines. In a study published in 2009, it was found lighter skinned black applicants reviewed more educated and had better work experience. And then in another famous study in 2011, it found darker skinned black women received harsher prison sentences than lighter skinned black women for the same crimes. So for many people, having lighter skin can mean the difference, how people treat them, see them, respect them. So as a result, we live in a world where beauty standards are often appropriated from people of color, whitewashed, regurgitated, only to be praised and adored then when previously laughed at and bullied. It tells someone that they're not beautiful unless they're pale. So as a result, skin bleaching creams, pills, injections, and other products come out and they contain hydroquinonines, with that work to reduce the amount of melanin in the skin by disrupting the melanin production. This can increase the risk of skin cancer, as melanin forms as the function to protect skin and eyes from UV rays. Chemical burns, infections, eczema, herpes, and other conditions also arrive. People have had skin blister off. And then the black market skin bleaches, which is a, the largest industry, mercury is an active ingredient which can cause mercury poisoning, leading to damage to skin, liver, kidneys, and the nervous system. So this is a super deadly product. Number three, multiple wives. The act of doing the deed in the bedroom can be messy sometimes. It happens, a lot of passion. And keeping that area on your body and in your life clean is important. Or so says my sixth grade health teacher. I don't know, I wasn't paying attention. But you gotta think back in the day how sometimes keeping that area fresh was difficult, especially because we have no self control and we went a little crazy with it. Take, for example, that having multiple wives was a status symbol. And let me tell you something they weren't sitting around waiting for the new season of Stranger Things. They were doing as they do on the Discovery Channel. Yeah, psych guys, I'm gonna actually talk about more eye getting poked. So, this is Lash Lure, a new and improved lash dye that would stop you from putting mascara on every day. Take my money. First manufactured in 1933, it was a beauty salon exclusive and bragged of it leaving you with a radiant personality. The first adverse after effect was reported literally July that year. Severe dermatitis of the eyelids surrounding the skin and edema that almost began immediately after dyeing the eyelashes with the Lashler product. Complete relief only occurred after they removed all her eyelashes. Four months later, four new cases of adverse side effects with Lashler that included vesicular eruption and marked edema, as well as carotid, okay, never mind, big words, you guys, their eyes were essentially bubbling and melting. It takes a year for the first fatality. 
Reality, a 52-year-old woman who made the mistake of plucking her eyebrows before dyeing them. Within hours, her eyes swelled shut, then her fever went to 104, and after eight days of agony and eyeball ulcers and decay, she died. Not only was there a rash, yes pun intended, of side effects from Lashler in 1933, but Franklin Roosevelt became president, and Roosevelt had a major goal to better public health. And in 1933, Chicago Fair said he put up the House of Horrors, showing befores and afters of unregulated products effect on people. One was a woman before and after being blinded by Lashler. Still, it wasn't until 1938 that the federal FDCA passed, which finally regulated cosmetics. The first product seized under the new law was Lashler, which was alleged to have been adulterated with poisonous or delirious substances, a coal tar preparation, and a bunch of other big scary terms. Last but not least though is Radium Girls. When radium was discovered and successfully used as a cancer treatment, people made the mistake of seeing it as an all powerful health tonic, taken essentially like a probiotic. It became an additive in a number of everyday products, from toothpaste to cosmetics and even food and drinks. One such preparation called Radithor was simply distilled water with tiny amounts of the substance dissolved in it. You could just buy it in cases, you know, like go to Costco, that type of thing. Then came the tacky 1920s fads, and one was glow in the dark water. The dials were covered in a special luminous paint, shone all the time, and didn't require charging in sunlight. It looked like magic. One of the first factories to produce these watches opened in New Jersey in 1916. It hired about 70 women, the Radium Girls, the first of thousands to be employed in many such factories in the United States. It was a well paid, glamorous job, and since it was the most expensive substance in the world and a wonder drug, Radium Girls believed they were getting healthier as they worked, especially because they were told to lick the paintbrushes to point them. What an honor. Then came the symptoms the toothaches, the fatigue, the nausea, the loss of taste, the infertility. Then came the first death. Molly Magia, 22, who died after years of agony and her doctor removing what was left of her jaw. Radium girls dropped like flies after that. For two years, their employers ferociously denied any connection between the girls' deaths and their work, even when their commission study concluded the girls had died from their pain. They did multiple more studies until one gave them the answer they wanted. So the public continued to assume radium was safe in their beauty products and in their food. In 1925, Harrison Martland's test proved conclusively radium had poisoned the watch painters by destroying their bodies from the inside. In 1927, attorney Raymond Barry agreed to accept this case, but many of the watch painters had just months to live and were forced to accept an out of court settlement. Still, their experiences made the issue of radium safety front page story across the world. So even if the United States Radium Corp denied its role and women continued to get sick and die for 11 more years, it wasn't until 1938 when a dying radium worker named Catherine DeWolf Donahue successfully sued Radium Dial Co. over her illness and that issue was settled. Number 10, spinning. Two words. Chewing tobacco. I am not the only one I know it who made this face while watching western movies and some grimy guy just like spits into a bucket like poo, some like brownie green slime. In saloons in the old wild west, spitting became so common that it had to be outlawed at one point. Men would spit tobacco onto the floor with spittoons and cups of doors lined the bar. Most of the time, they missed. The job of cleaning them often fell to junior shop assistants, which was a worse job than cleaning a fast food chain bathroom. They essentially became little cesspools of disease, and people got really worried eventually because, no duh, they're spitting all their stuff everywhere. Following the devastating flu epidemic of 1918, plus the constant fear of TB, anti spitting campaigns were undertaken and it was outlawed. Number nine, shine bright like a diamond. If somebody told you that your face was glowing back in the late 30s, that would be the highest of all compliments. You'd be like, oh my god, thank you. I am not a vampire, but thank you. Thoradia was a beauty product company that made radioactive creams, radioactive powders, radioactive lipsticks, anything to get your glam on, all for the price of radioactive products. It didn't end well. This is insane to me. They took pride in using thorium and radium lead to tone facial tissues and remove wrinkles and all that jazz. And the product was doing so well that it circulated in Italy, Portugal, Romania, Egypt, Belgium, and France. Worldwide. It wasn't until 1937 until the French government caught on to these little pesky side effects, some would call. So the radium would literally make your skin glow a bit. That was the pull. That was like the, no way, really? Debit. And alongside the glow, also, you were having insane side effects that would ruin the rest of your life. Maybe that's Paul Rudd's secret. If his jaw starts to fall off, we'll know something's up, perhaps. Number eight, the humors. Nope, this is not a joke. 
Ha, though it sounds like it. Ever heard the phrase to be in good humor? Well, it goes back to this. I mean, probably. I actually don't know, but it sounds like the two are connected. The four humors were the basis of medical treatment in medieval times. The idea was introduced by Hippocrates all the way back in ancient Greece, which combined ancient science, naturalistic knowledge, and philosophy. The four humors were blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. They were organized to represent the four elements, the four qualities of cold, hot, moist, and dry, as well as the four seasons and planets. If something was wrong with you, then it was because one of the humors was out of whack. If you were depressed, something was wrong with your black bile, for instance. Do I know what black bile is? No, I don't want to ever know. Are you too hot? Well, bloodletting will be the solution for that. The factors controlling your humoral makeup involved sex, age, temperament, and many more. Bloodletting was the most popular way of balancing the humors, and it was assumed to have a relationship with most diseases, from smallpox to pseudoscientific hysteria. What, you horny? Let's bloodlet ya. Does the sentence dysfunctional hair removing cream raise alarms in you? Because it does in me, and apparently the FDA, it's Kremlu. Advertised as perfectly safe and somehow permanent way to remove hair, this cream actually poisoned the user instead, like everything else on this list. And while women mostly applied it to the upper lip, the problem showed up literally everywhere on the body, according to historian Gwen Clay. Now, women lost their hair all over their bodies, as well as suffering paralysis and even damage to their eyes, she written. So, one of Cromerlu's active ingredients was thallium acetate. Thallium was also used as rat poison and has since been banned in the US due to how toxic it is to even people and animals exposed accidentally. Cromerlu didn't stay on the market, but it was no thanks to the FDA. The Journal of American Medical Association, which in 1932 described the product as a viciously dangerous depilatory, led to the diagnostic fight against Cromerlu by publishing a series of articles about its effects. Women who suffered side effects of the popular product sued the company for forcing it into bankruptcy in 1932 after winning more than 2.5 million in damages. But the FDA, when consulted, could only refer to the JAMA's work, and Kremlu didn't qualify as a drug, and the agency didn't have power to regulate cosmetics yet at the time. Number six, no hand washing. I don't know. Believe it or not, washing your hands as a doctor before doing anything was a controversial idea. Today, especially due to the last two years, we all have a tune we sing while washing our hands to ensure we're laughing for like full 20 seconds. We've all done it. But when doctors discovered it was their fault people were getting sick, they didn't rejoice, they got offended. The whole conversation started because of a man called Ignaz Semmelweis. He was studying the differences between two birthing hospitals, one run by midwives, the other by doctors and students. The mortality rate at the latter was way higher than the other. They were dying from something known as childbed fever, more closely known as sepsis. After a series of trial and error, he hypothesized that it was because the students were touching cadavers and then touching the mothers. He then made them clean every tool in their hands with chlorine solution, literally the best thing to kill germs, though he didn't know that at the time, he just assumed it would work. Well, wouldn't you know mortality rates improved significantly, but when he tried to enforce his findings, doctors were upset they were being blamed for the deaths. He ended up getting fired over it and eventually thrown into a mental asylum near the end of his life. <sighs> Considering what we know now, that's rough. Number five. Dark dental days. Dental health is important. We have the charcoal toothpaste trend that I myself even hopped onto recently, but why are we even doing it? Do we know, other than it's on TikTok? Well, it helps remove stains, but aside from that, there's no hard evidence that this is the next best brushing method. We do it because it's popular. It feels like we're missing out on something. Well, Queen Elizabeth the first apparently had a pretty strong desire for a Mars bar too, but back in the day, they didn't have TikTok. Brushing wasn't cool, nor was it perfected in any sense. The queen's teeth became riddled with cavities. Her teeth straight up began to rot, and subsequently turn black. But seeing as she's the literal queen, people wanted to be just like her in any way. She started a short-lived trend where women blacken their teeth on purpose just so they would appear rich enough to afford sugar. That's wild. That's like me walking around in a neck brace being like, oh yeah, I crashed my Lamborghini. I totally have one of those. Number four, arsenic. I think they were confusing this chemical with Accutane, which is a chemical we use today to treat acne. But for a while, arsenic wafers were used. Yes. The poison, arsenic, the thing that would kill you. Yeah, that one. In the 19th century, arsenic was marketed as a safe way 
Safeway to effectively clear your skin. It also claimed to restore a youthful complexion that we as humans always long for. Now, it did create a very pallid complexion, but not because it was restoring the gift of life, but because it was killing off the consumer's blood cells. Yay! It also cleared acne pretty well, but it also created a dependency on the product. If the user discontinued using the wafers, then the acne would return even worse this time. Therefore, it would create a vicious cycle of slowly poisoning oneself to death because you'd have to go back on it so you'd look hot. I don't know. Number three. You do what with my wee? Back to the Romans again, and back to the pee. At least the Incas were keeping it outside the body. I guess Romans wanted a clean mouth, and there wasn't any minty fresh mouthwash to reach for. So, what do you use? We, lots of we, specifically Portuguese we. It was just the most sought after. Now, I'm not a doctor, but I feel like there was more wine drinking than water drinking in Rome, more than people would like to admit it. So, if that is the byproduct of all that wine drinking, and you're giving that a swish in your mouth. Well, all I can say is I'm just gonna give that a big pass on playing spin the bottle. Number two, moss. Okay, I'm not the only one who has asked this question in their minds. Periods. How in the heck did we deal with them without pads, tampons, diva cups, and my doll? I don't know. How? Well, <laughs> it doesn't look good, folks. It took a lot of trial and error to get us where we are now. The first disposable pads only came onto the market in 1888. Like, ugh, what? Even earlier prototypes of menstrual cups were made out of aluminum or hard rubber. But you may be surprised to learn that moss was a common resource. Yeah, the thing you see on rocks and trees. Cloth and cotton weren't enough, so they resorted to using moss to help absorb ant flow when she came by. It could have been grabbed from anywhere. Although we know that moss isn't the most hygienic of materials, as it could be grabbed from anywhere, as I just previously stated, a rock, a tree, who knows. Physicians believed it had antiseptic properties. They even used it on the battlefield to stem the flow of blood. Menstruation at the time was considered a sign of witchcraft, even though it happened every month. Poisonous and dangerous at the time. Okay, I know desperate times call for desperate measures, but like, they reused it. They didn't throw it out after. Ugh. Ugh. And finally, number one. Roman toilets. When I go to the washroom, number two, whatever, that's my time. I'll straight up hold it for like three business days until I get home. It's called a bowel movement for a reason. It's a movement, it's an event. I need isolation, quietness. These poor Romans, I mean, thank you for inventing the toilet and all, that's really great and dandy, but I feel very bad for the first group of individuals that had to use these stone benches. The early OG toilets. God, that looks so cold. Also, I guess stalls, like walls, they were invented until much later. Couldn't have thrown up some Bristol board, Euphelius? I don't want to be shoulder to shoulder with a guy who accidentally gulped uh, some public spa water hours prior. And don't even worry about wiping also because that wasn't invented until much later. You just do the old scrape, do the old stone cold scrape off the bench and then call it a day. Give this video a Roman thumbs down if you're glad for toilets. That means thumbs up. In 10th place, we have how to cure hair loss. So while technically this is a top 10 list, I might be cheating that a little bit today. When I was doing my research, I came across so many different ways throughout history of attempting to cure hair loss that I knew I just had to share them with y'all. So there was no way I was gonna limit myself. Let's start off with uh, 50 BCE Rome. So Romans who experienced hair loss tended to rum myrrh into their scalps, which sounds simple enough until you learn that other Romans tried a more drastic remedy, which involved burning a donkey's genitals to ash, which was then mixed with the urine of the person losing their hair and applying that mixture to the head. Moving on to Egypt. Donkey hooves, dates, and dog paws would be ground together, mixed with oil, cooked, and rubbed on bald heads as an ancient remedy for hair growth. A medical script known as the Ebers Papyrus offers a different recipe for Egyptian hair loss, mixing fat from a hippopotamus, crocodile, male cat, snake, and ibex, which is then applied to the scalp. If that doesn't work, the follow-up solution is to boil porcupine hair and apply it to the bald areas for four days. Finally, in ancient Greece, if women were going bald, they sometimes used a hair mask consisting of a mix of feces, urine, and menstrual scarletness. Okay. Hippocrates endorsed a mix of pigeon droppings, opium, horseradish, beetroot, and spices as an ancient remedy for hair growth, while Aristotle recommended goat urine as a treatment instead. Um, I'll pass on all fronts, thanks. 
In ninth place, we have separating lashes with a safety pin. This is probably the most modern trick on today's list, and it comes courtesy of film star Audrey Hepburn. She liked to darken, plump, and lengthen her lashes like the best of them, and she had one trick to ensure that her lashes looked naturally fanned out and clump free. And it wasn't, you know, some sort of magic mascara wand. After applying a layer of mascara, her makeup artist, Alberto De Rossi, would take a pin and meticulously separate every single lash. Just for a fun little reference, the upper eyelid alone has an average of roughly 70 to 150 lashes, making that undertaking quite the long and possibly, you know, dangerous process. To prepare for the undertaking, it's recommended to curl your lashes first to make things easier. One must start at the base near the waterline and pull the pin through to the top, separating, yep, each individual lash. So this defines each lash, as well as helps to distribute the dark mascara pigment more evenly. Once you complete the first eye, repeat on the next, and then proceed to your lower lid lashes if, you know, if you'd like. I'll stick with an overall like lash brush, thanks, and like my reliable false lashes. That's good enough for me. As much as it hurts to yank out the occasional lash from lash glue or liquid latex, at least I'm not risking, you know, stabbing my eye. Trust me, I'm a heck of a klutz. In eighth place, we have geisha beauty. So during the high-end era, geishas would blacken their teeth using a mixture of oxidized iron fillings steeped in an acidic solution. One of the main reasons for this practice was the fact that for hundreds of years, pitch black objects were regarded as immensely pretty. And unlike the Western ideals that folks like myself have been raised with, that's just how things were there. The women used to remove their heavy makeup with a nightingale poop, which apparently did wonders for their skin. The active chemical in the bird poop is guanine, which allegedly cleanses the skin and rejuvenates it. Now, geishas aside, Back in the day, the beauty of Japanese women was often judged on the basis of their hair length, and the ideal length was considered two feet below their waist. I don't want to think about how long it would take to brush hair that long, never mind the hairballs that would form. Or mats. Nah. Number seven, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was born, what did people even do to smell good? What? I don't. What happened? Deodorant was actually first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called Mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide. It was stored in a metal container, nothing like speed stick at all. It wasn't discreet or anything. It was bad. But ancient Egyptians, eh, even worse. They had to use ostrich eggs when it came to smelling good in the pits. They made perfumes as well and were among the first to use any type of deodorant. So that's that's a pretty good start. Thank you. Thank you so much, ancient Egyptians. Hence the ostrich egg factor. They had to start somewhere. They mixed a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shell, and then nuts, and bam, there you go. You're ready for the day. Just pop it on. Another method was a little more yummy than the ostrich eggs and nuts method. Egyptians would use porridge balls. Yeah, flavored porridge rolled up and securely tucked under your arms. Honestly, that seems like a better alternative. Sometimes when you put antiperspirants or like deodorant on, it gets like all, it all crumbles apart. It's like feta cheese all of a sudden. You're like, what happened to this stick? I want, I would rather have porridge balls than just call it a day, boom. In sixth place, we have Egyptian makeup. Look, everyone knows about ancient Egyptian using cold around their eyes to shield against the sun, deter flies, and overall just look stunning. Personally, I very much still appreciate the practice, along with my collection of eyeliner pens. I currently have like four black ones on the go for reasons. If you don't believe me, here are the two I have on me that I used to touch up this makeup with before I started talking today. But what you might not have known was that crocodile dung mixed with donkey's milk was used by Cleopatra as a face mask. She also famously bathed in milk with rose petals for hours, which like, honestly, goals. Cheeks were blushed up using a mixture of clay and crushed beetles, which was something also done later on by Queen Elizabeth I to get her memorable red lips. One of the most popular cosmetic ingredients in ancient Greece was olive oil. According to legend, a Greek cook named Calamus invented soap by mixing olive oil with wood ash from Mount Sapo, so it could be used for cleaning utensils at sacrifices. However, when he washed his hands with this mixture, his skin became soft and smooth. It was clear that olive oil had cleansing and beautifying properties. So you're telling me that my big fat Greek wedding lied to me about Greeks using Windex for everything? Curse you, Hollywood. In fifth place, we have a dimple machine. In the 1930s, dimples were considered to be one of the most beautiful accessories any gal could have, leading to Isabel Gilbert inventing the dimple machine in 1936, which promised to give you dimples. This contraption, also referred to as the dimpler, consisted of a chin strap that held two soft rubber dimple indenters in place, one on each cheek. The strap had a coil that created pressure and was described as very uncomfortable and uh, the dimples left your face within a few hours anyways. Jeepers, I guess a lot of folks really wanted to look like Shirley Temple, which is fair. She was pretty adorable. I feel like nowadays, thanks to the interwebs, we have a lot more folks that we can decide that we want to look like. Personally, I'm a mix of wanting to look like my celebrity crush and a brat stall, or a Barbie, depending on the day. In fourth place, we have hair secrets. Alrighty, Let's spin the wheel to see where we're starting with this one. 
Ah, grease. Alrighty, to achieve blonde hair, which was highly coveted, women would drench their hair in vinegar to bleach it, which would lead to, you know, hair loss and thus the popularity of wigs. Something I didn't know before today was that in ancient Egypt, only women from higher classes were allowed to have long hair, and slave women had to cut their hair very short, and the hair cut off was often used for making headpieces for the aristocrats. Before hairspray was invented, women used to use lard to keep their huge wigs in place. There were many times when rats jumped on women's wigs from the smell of the lard. Ok, that's a big no for me. Sure, I attract the occasional flies with the amount of hairspray that I wear when I curl my hair, but that's plenty. Modern sidebar, during the World War II days, women had to make deal without wax and used sandpaper to remove unwanted body hair. Yeah, I'm shuddering. Number 3. The George Costanza Today, every girl wants those long, luscious locks. No split ends with healthy hair and just a radiant glow. But women in ye olde Europe were after the chrome dome kind of look, if you know what I'm saying. They had their hair pulled back, revealing a large portion of their forehead. Hey, look ladies, not that there's anything wrong with balding. It happens. I'd be very ignorant to say that it might happen to me too. It could. When I get old, it'll probably happen. I actually know a guy who's balding right now. Shout out to him. It's just strange how something that could be considered not beautiful today was all the rage back then. Queens literally sat down on their chairs and said, Give me the George Costanza look, please. I'm feeling like a real winner today, Jerry. In second place, we have the uses of baths. Nowadays, I know I personally love a good bath to relax, you know, aching muscles or just decompress. But history wasn't always that way. Vapor baths have been described as similar to a modern day sauna, with unknown vapors that claim to cure all kinds of ailments. Sadly, the Victorian era bath ended up burning more people than actually curing them. Next up, we have the crocodile feces bath. The Greeks and Romans apparently found the best way to fight wrinkles and lines was by collecting the feces of the crocodile and and having a bath in it. Apparently it reduced aging to quite an extent. I'll uh, stick with my Epsom salts and uh, lush bath bombs. Thanks! In first place we have methods of obtaining pale skin. I'm very grateful that my snow white complexion is quite natural, thanks to my German Irish mutt heritage, but for those who wanted it, here are some ways not to do it. Going back to using olive oil for everything, apparently if you combine it with white lead, it can be used to lighten the skin tone. Although this made people's faces visibly lighter, the women who did this were also subjected to death by slow lead poisoning, which was, you know, absorbed into their skin. Lead used to be used for a lot of makeup, and while it was efficient, it was also pretty dang deadly. Speaking of deadly, around Around the 6th century, an aristocratic woman, in a haste to develop that pale, death-like pallor, which was very famous in those times, used to drain their bodies of all their red fluid, one drop at a time. Well then, that explains why everyone was so weak and tired all the time. But geez, don't waste that elixir, make sure you're donating it to your friendly neighborhood vampires. A common way to remove freckles and tans, and achieve that flawless pale complexion, was by using lemon juice mixed with sugar and borax on the face in the 1890s. And once again, for that eternal facial glow and skin bleaching, more modern women would wear a face mask taped to their faces while they slept. I would never be able to sleep if I tried that. In less lethal practices, those geisha women I mentioned before used rice flour powder based paste as a foundation. Hey, now that's something I feel like I could try and not risk my health with. Kicking off the list at number 10, Hot Topics. Over in Finland, they're changing the game. The sauna over there is considered a national institution. It's a large part of both Finnish and Estonian cultures. These saunas are commonly found surrounding Finland's lakes, corporate headquarters, and, oh yeah, of course, the parliament house. Saturday in Finland is traditional sauna day. It's not Saturday for the boys, it's just Saturday and we're gonna, we're gonna breathe in each other's mouths for a bit. I can't even fit into a bathtub. I look like an octopus trying to escape a jar. It's not relaxing, it's not a good Saturday at all. I wanna move to Finland. When government leaders can't agree on an issue, they take it to the sauna. How amazing does that sound? In the middle of passing a bill, dudes will just pause and then go hit the sauna. We need this over here. Finns describe the sauna as a secret weapon behind their diplomatic advances. Director of the Finnish Employers Confederation described the ritual saying that it's easier to discuss problems openly. It's like when we're doing a presentation in class, they always say to imagine everybody naked. Well, this was just that scenario played out in real life. Take away the briefcase and tie, you're just a naked dude sitting on a bench talking about inflation. Kind of an odd picture when you think of it. Number 9. The Outhouse One thing I am glad I don't have to deal with anymore is outhouses. Not that I ever did, it's just something I don't want to do. I called the chief again last night and uh, he said it wasn't it again. Outhouses have been around for a long time. 
technically just a hole in the ground where the business is done. It wasn't until later a small wood shack was built around said hole, and then it became an outhouse. Because the design of the outhouse is quite simple, there is a few design flaws that really just don't make any sense. Okay, yeah, it had to be built away from the house, as it is a pit full of refuse that exit a human being, but it's also built away from your house, so if you gotta go bad, I mean, you gotta go bad, you might not make it. This also is not so fun if you live in a place where it's cold, and you have to dress just to take a leak. But really, what is the craziest thing is that after a certain time, that hole is going to fill up with an unholy godliness I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And now you gotta move it somewhere else. I know they wouldn't fill up that fast, but after a few years living in the same place, there'd be a few holes everywhere, and that's, that's just not good decoration, is it? Not to mention, if you were living in the time of the expanding west, an unseen rattlesnake or scorpion could make the potty time your last. Not just stay indoors, thanks. Number eight, there's not a visine for that. Does anybody else sneeze when they look at the sun, or is that just me? Do I have issues? I have a handful of allergies, and one of them apparently is a star, that's neat. My eyes are literally always dry. I think I forget to blink. I'm not really sure what's going on, but today there's a visee luckily for everything. Eye drops are common, but written in the oldest book of medicine, the Evers Papyrus, chock full of ancient Egyptian medical recipes, it contained old optical treatment. Even in Egyptian artwork, you can find ancient cataract treatments. British archeologist Austin Henry Layard found these clay tablets from ancient Babylonia around 625 BC, and treatment for dry eyes was a little different than today. Today all you have to do is and you're good. Back then, you had to get chemicals from plants and then mix them with prayers. Good game, good luck. One ancient tablet described the treatment of the time saying, if a man's eyes are affected with dryness, he shall rub an onion and then drink a beer and then apply oil to his eyes. Just mix all that shit, put it in your mouth, and then thou shalt disembowel a yellow frog mixed in its gall and curd and apply it to its eyes. I don't even know what the fuck that means. Like imagine getting that on a prescription, you're like a yellow frog, what? Number seven, mice flavored toothpaste. It's ancient Egypt, life is great. You got the pyramids, you got the Nile River, and you got some guy who claims to be a doctor and he's pulling out the brains of your last king through his nose so he can be mummified for the afterlife. That's just awesome. Just another day under Ra's warm sand. Egyptians just knew how to live, and they knew dental hygiene was important. So they came up with toothpaste. Sore tooth? Try this toothpaste. What was this toothpaste made of, you ask? Well, it was made of crushed mice, of course. Ugh, God. I mean, here I am thinking that just some herbs crushed up with some water would be fine to eliminate bad breath, but after all, having nice teeth and nice breath is sexy. So the Egyptians took some mice and they crushed them up with other ingredients in what must have been the most foul and rancid concoction this side of the Nile River. Just go ahead, put that goop in your mouth. You'll look okay, you'll look great after. Oh, just brush it on there, smells great. Oh, that's amazing. Number six, the great stink of 1858. It's one thing living through a pandemic, but at least we're not living through something called the Great Stink. Yeah, the Great Stink of 1858. Who was responsible for this? What did you eat? What happened? Well, this was an event in central London and it lasted for a few months in the summertime too, which is just great for great stinks. It was so hot and dry that the Thames dried up leaving just sewage, just all that gross you can imagine. The smell was so bad, Parliament had to close for an entire day. I wanna know who the first guy was to be like, you know what, nah, I'm going home. This sucks, this sucks. Good call. In order to continue work, Parliament had to soak the curtains on the riverside of the building in lime chloride just so they wouldn't be sick. They just soak it in chloride to be like, that's better, it's better, we think. They were on the verge of moving their entire operation to Oxford, that's how bad it was. Members of the committee were quitting their jobs. While this sounds all bad, hundreds of tons of limes were being discharged into sewers to help the smell. So if you had a stuffy nose in July 1858, you could have made 1,500 pounds a week just messing around with limes. You missed your shot. Number five, the human fly trap. This is honestly so five head, a brilliant play might be one of the best moves I've ever seen. Have you ever been to a picnic with a nice sandwich, some fresh crisp potato chips, and an ice cold lemonade as you sit on a warm blanket, enjoying the view just over yonder? When all of a sudden you are attacked by a swarm of bugs that just ruin the vibes, and now you don't even want the sandwich. Who made this lemonade? It's so bitter. I don't even like chips. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt felt the same way, except they had a great way to deal with it. Simply take a few of my servants and slather them in honey. 
place them away from our royal picnic and bada bing bada boom you got no more flies bothering you or your sandwich. This honestly sounds completely cruel and at a time when hygiene in general wasn't great, how did they get all that honey off? Sure a dip in the Nile will get rid of most of it but you probably just glaze yourself for a crocodile's lunch. Honey will get stuck in places where the sun don't shine. And just like shame, you can never really wash it off. Number four, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over, honey. I burn so easily. I have freckles for two days, then the rest is just red and un just bad, all bad. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day and feel like I'm about to faint. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? They didn't have Banana Breeze SPF 35. What did they do? Well, ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty. You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work? Yeah, buckle up. Their routine was written on a tomb wall and also scrolls. They used rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol and that was used to block the sun off. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. Just some chick named Jasmine, she was like, don't look at it, just stop. Ancient Greeks used olive oil as sunscreen, which as far as UV protection goes, did absolutely next to nothing. You'd be burnt and dehydrated, but you know what? Can line, so. Number three, spit black. Back in the roaring 20s, they had mascara, just like we do now. But unlike the little tubes of stuff we have, they had a block or cake of the stuff. To get it to a state where they could actually apply it to their lashes, they would need to add water. And what's the quickest form of water? That's right, it's your spit. The mascara cake stuff was made of soap and coloring, which you don't really want to put near your eyes. But then, knowing that people are using their spit to apply it, it's your own spit, so I guess if you're comfortable with that, you do you, pal, but makes me think of dudes using their saliva to like lick their eyebrows. Ick. Number two, ancient socks. Somebody got me socks as a gift over the holidays, and let me tell you, still the best thing you can get. Socks and lip balm, you can do anything you want. Game over. Socks in ancient Greece were not the right and left neon green athletic socks that you have today. No, not even close. Socks came around in the 8th century BC, made fresh from, you guessed it, animal hairs. Yeah, it was gross. This actually led to Romans tying animal skins around their feet and then tying them up. Cut to the 2nd century AD in ancient Rome, the sock game got real. Romans began using fabrics instead of animal skins and it was softer, lighter, and all that jazz. And then later on in the 5th century, socks were worn only by the most holy. Socks were associated with the church and they were considered a symbol of purity. Yeah, you heard it. Socks would go all the way up to your leg. A little different than the New Balance ones we have now that just go up to your ankle that, you know, fall off when you're halfway to work and then make you really upset. I have one right now. I'm gonna go figure it out. Number one, heavy stomach. We as humans need food and water to live. Water honestly being number one. I mean, I could eat a little bit more, but water's more important. But it is what it is sometimes. People in the past had no choice but to build water pipes out of lead. Sure, maybe it wasn't common knowledge that the lead was toxic, but a lot of people did know. So that's why all the cities that sparked up during the Industrial Revolution were built with such. Lead as a material did make sense, as it was cheap and easy to use. So that simply outweighed the health risk of lead poisoning. Lead was a common material in other products as well. But when your drinking water is supposed to be fresh, maybe it's time to spend a little more so we don't end up, you know, spending a lot more on healthcare for lead poisoning. After years of being underground, the pipes corrode and leak toxins into the water stream. It's why in older cities, a lot of time and money is spent today replacing old pipe infrastructure. To me, it's a classic case of, eh, let somebody else deal with them, sure it's fine. Well, I'm off to go work in a completely safe asbestos factory, I'm sure there's nothing wrong or bad in there. <laughs> In 10th place, we have crocodile dung baths. When I picture taking a bath, I'm picturing my like off-white tub, a generous handful of Epsom salts, and maybe like a lush bath fizz if I'm feeling really fancy. But also not always because cleaning the tub after that is a chore in itself, and I'm normally only taking a bath instead of a shower if I'm really exhausted. So right now. <laughs> Many different animal products and byproducts have been claimed to work wonders on the skin, but this one might be up there with the grossest. In ancient times, the Greeks and Romans used a special ingredient in their body toning mud baths. Crocodile excrement. Full body bathtubs were filled with a mixture of earth and freshly harvested uh, feces, which was also used to make anti aging face masks. They believed the reptile poop would uh, dramatically slow down the aging process. I'm terrified of the creatures as a self preservation rule, and this is definitely a something that made me want to hurl. Look, all I knew before today about crocodiles, other than just how scary they are, is that they shared the osteoderm trait with dinosaurs, and I'd like to go back to just knowing that. Thanks! 
In ninth place, we have pearl powder in China. So some historians and beauticians suggested that the concubine turned Empress Dowager Cixi, who ruled for 47 years in the 19th century, popularized Chinese pearl powder for its beauty benefits, since she was widely recognized for her leadership as well as her beauty. The pearl powder is rubbed onto the face and is said to promote brightening, exfoliation, and anti-wrinkling. Many of these pearls are cultivated along China's river basin in the Shanghai area and are ground into a powder to be used in beauty treatments. After three to four years of cultivation, oysters grow to about 10 inches long and are harvested by fishermen. Now apparently this routine is still used in today's society and I'd love to know in the comments if that's true or not. In 8th place, we have how to stay pale. I'm thankful my pale complexion is all natural and while I've been tempted a couple of times in my life to maybe tan it, I managed to avoid temptation. Last summer was probably the most I've considered tanning, only because I was getting horrid sunburns from my day job at the time and you know, considered evening them out for other work purposes. Not that having tan skin is a bad thing by any means, but I'm perfectly content being a Snow White knockoff. By the time Elizabeth I sat on the English throne, her subjects associated color in the skin with those who engaged in backbreaking labor outdoors. The whiter the skin, the richer you could appear. Since human beings naturally have a bit of color, the beauty treatment back then was to apply a powder made of white lead, calcium carbonate, and hydroxide to every inch of exposed flesh. You know, poison in a bowl. That powder introduced toxins over time that caused various side effects, including skin inflammation and baldness, leading to a couple of different wig trends, which I promise I will touch on. To further emphasize the pale skin, by the late 1800s, some women would use a blue or violet pencil to trace their veins to make their skin appear paler. Hey, I've used liquid latex and eyeliner for a lot worse, so I can't really judge that part at all. In less lethal methods, though, some ladies created a toner out of strawberries and wine and slathered it on their skin to help keep their porcelain complexion, and now that's something I'd try. Hey, I've heard a lot about the health benefits of wine, and I'm not opposed to experimenting. Number seven, Victorian Laundry Day. You spill some mustard on your shirt today, that stain will be gone by the time you get home. We're pretty advanced when it comes to quick stain removal today, but like the Romans, which I'll talk about later, it wasn't always smooth sailing. Take the 18th century, for example, when Laundry Day came around, it was an event. It was like an ultimate chore. They had to take daylight in consideration and plan their washing days, as in more than one. The Victorian era was exhausting. They would soak their clothes overnight, then the next day would be spent soaping the them up, boiling them, rinsing, soaping again, rinsing again, maybe soap one more in case you know there's too much pee pee, and then rinsed another time, wrung out, mangled, laid out to dry, hence the sunlight timing, starched and then slowly ironed. Cut to today, we have to encourage adults not to eat Tide Pods or drink bleach. We'll get there, maybe, I don't know. In sixth place, sweat. While I'm not against using a highlighter to make my skin dewy and glowing, I'm not talking about a natural shimmer today. Heck, I'm not even talking about practices similar to like WWE, where they're constantly spraying water on their faces and bodies to appear gleaming before they even walk down a ramp. Gladiator sweat was something that used to be used to make women's complexions glow. The sweat of great gladiator men was collected just so that it could be mixed in facial masks and other beauty products. And I think my skin broke out reading that. I'm glad we as a society know better now, with the knowledge that, you know, sweat clogs the heck out of one's pores. In fifth place, we have urine mouthwash. Okay, so this is tied with a dung bath on the top things that are going to make Alexa puke today. Teeth are a vital part of your overall beauty, but before the invention of modern dental technology, it was tricky to keep them clean and bright. The ancient Romans believed that they had the solution, and that solution was urine. The ammonia in urine is actually good for disinfecting infection and it continued to be used as an active ingredient in mouthwash until at least the 18th century. I did know about ammonia for disinfection before today, since I believe it's a survival tactic used to disinfect poison and venom from wounds if need be, but having that in my mouth is not for me. No thanks! In fourth place, we have the tapeworm diet. So beauty starts from the inside out, and maintaining a trim and slim figure was pretty prized in England during the 1800s. One particularly disgusting beauty regimen that gained some traction was the tapeworm diet, where people looking to shed pounds would swallow pills containing sanitized tapeworm larvae, which would take up residence uh, in your stomach. The worms would divert your excess calories to their own bodies and grow larger and larger until you had them removed. Thankfully, this particular diet fell out of fashion pretty quickly, minus a resurgence in the 90s. I've heard about this and accidentally swallowing a tapeworm is up there on my list of irrational fears. Also, does anyone remember the Mr. Meaty tapeworm episode? I only watched it for the first time recently, and oh my goodness did it ever scar my brain. Granted, that show as a whole is nightmare inducing. Number three, royal bum. The groom of the stool is a little bit different than the groom of a wedding. It was perhaps one of the worst jobs to have, but, but, pun intended, it's one of the most important roles. The groom of the king's close stool was a position created during King Henry VIII's reign. Their job was to wipe the king's butt. And if that doesn't sound horrible enough, this poor lad would carry the king's stool with him, like on his back, like a Jansport, and then monitor the king's meal times, and they would plan their day around when they thought the king would take a shit. 
I would be so anxious if a guy wearing a box toilet was just hanging out near me. He's like, hey, you feeling all right, boss? You good? You feeling full? That was a lot of bread earlier. You sure? All right, take five. Just, I don't know. Just take a look. I don't know. I'll let you be just jump. You must be thinking, what poor soul got stuck with this job? Well, this job was an honor, my friend. Sons of noblemen were awarded this role. You would get pretty close to the king, I mean, obviously, but as time went on, these grooms became secretaries to that king. Pretty good upgrade. Eventually, getting a higher pay and benefits. Yeah, I would hope so. Even the king's walking, talking toilet gets dental back in the day. How neat is that? In second place, we have Wigglard. See, I promised I'd get back to talking about wigs. Big hair has been a symbol of beauty throughout the ages, but most ladies in the Middle Ages didn't get the kind of nutrition necessary to really grow and style luxurious locks, so they faked it with wigs. Kind of like I do today. I got a lot of wigs. The trend of looking and being ill would cause the hair to fall out pretty easily, and these giant hair pieces weren't a little too sanitary. Victorian wigs were constructed out of wooden frames that had hair draped over and that was glued on with pastes of bear grease and beef lard. That tasty mixture was irresistible to rats, who would often nest inside hair pieces while they were not worn until wig cages were invented to keep them safe while the wigger was sleeping. So I definitely dabble in wig styling myself as a cosplayer, but the worst I've ever done to a wig was use hot glue before I knew better. Also rats, no thank you. I recently found a mouse in my place and freaked the heck out. Wigs are definitely still built using wooden frames when need be, but got to be is more the adhesive of choice these days. Which reminds me, I've got a Barbie wig I need to style tonight. In our first place, we have Geisha Makeup and Remover. So I'm personally a fan of the Neutrogena makeup wipes, but those didn't always exist in history. According to about.com, Geishas would use the dung of nightingales to remove their very thickly applied makeup at the end of the day. And when I say thickly applied, I mean their makeup is caked on. So I guess this is how Mulan, she must have had it on her sleeve? <laughs> the first step is to apply Binsuke, which is a type of wax that acts as a barrier between the skin and the cosmetics, so the primer of the face. Then there's Oshiroi, the white face powder, which was made up of lead, zinc, and seashells. You know, crunchy and lethal. Benai is used on the eyes, lips, and brows, and is a crimson powder made from the crushed safflower petals. Benai is not used all over the lips by the geishas, but rather to create a flower bud effect. And Mako is used strictly for the lower lip. That red I mentioned before is also used to sculpt the outside corner of the eye and to create a subtle pink contour on the cheeks and nose. To achieve a delicate effect, the eyebrows are painted crimson and then black with charcoal. Some folks also shave their brows to make it easier to apply makeup. So I see where Drag Queen's got the idea. The hair would be brushed with wax to keep it in place. And thanks to Guanine, which is a natural cleanser for the skin and contains bird poop, it apparently makes a great makeup remover as well as a purifying facial mask. The Daily Mail reported that Tom Cruise rubs a mixture of nightingale poop, rice bran, and water on his skin on a regular basis to keep his youthful look. And while I'll admit the guy does look good for his age, I'm not exactly about to take beauty tips from a rich Scientologist. The only thing we will ever have in common is a love of popcorn and the inability to answer a question if we aren't prepped. Kicking off the list at number 10, pig toilets. Yeah, we'll start off with a nasty one. Look, we're on the part six now. We're talking about some ancient hygiene practices. It's gonna get gross. It just has to at this point. I've talked about Roman toilets, horsehair dental floss. So now we gotta dive into some yucky stuff. Pig toilets began around 200 BC in China and these pig toilets were actually pretty common. You would just go to the washroom over top of a pig pen. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty awful, but also it's all they had. It's pretty awful, but I would say it's worse for the pigs. Definitely worse for the pigs. The pigs would eat the waste because it was mixed into their food. They couldn't tell the difference. Ugh, horrible. This was one of the few options to manage waste, especially in areas where plumbing wasn't possible. I talked about pigs going to court in your recent Bumblebee video. If I was a pig, I would be pressing charges left, right, and center after this. That's so disgusting. We're at number 10 and I want to puke. Nice, buckle up. Number nine, water closets. This one sounds fun, a closet full of water. What a blast, pun intended. Back in the 1800s, all over Europe, our modern day version of the bathroom came to life. Thankfully, I'm very glad this happened. If it didn't happen, it'd be, it'd be a little bit different nowadays. It takes two things to have a water closet, a home big enough for a room purely devoted to waste, which is amazing, and of course, running water, that definitely helps. Sir John Harrington, godson to Queen Elizabeth I, was determined to invent what we now know as the basic toilet. Back in 1596, he created this idea, and people actually made fun of this guy for spending so much time working on a useless device. Yeah. The more we know. Cut to 200 years later, another inventor by the name of Alexander Cummings reworked the water closet, added an S-trap, the little valve between the top and the bottom parts of the bowl, and now we're on the right track. Then a couple years later, in 1777, Samuel Prosser applied for a plunger closet patent and got it. A year later after that, Joseph Brama enters the toilet game, adds a valve on the bottom, an old school ball cock. So we're getting there, slowly over time. Different inventors are bringing their new ideas in, all so that we can go and take a 
Brodman was a sailor at the time, so his water closet was often used on ships of that era. Today we have toilets that flush automatically. Once you get up or move around, the sensors think you're done, and then they blast away. If you stand and wipe, good game. This thing's gonna be making noise all day long. Number eight. Bald face. In another video on things too woke for this era, I talked about how it was once cool to have no hair on your face at all. I can't grow any facial hair, so this is this reaches out to me. This is good. I like this. I like punching out on this fact. Well, Queen Elizabeth I was the first to bring this idea into Western culture. She influenced women to completely pluck their eyebrows, and on top of that, they would also shave their hairline back as far as they could, so their faces would be as large and as big and bright as possible. Just right there, like the big moon, just hmm. It was common for women to soak bandages in a mix of ammonia, vinegar, walnut oil, all to hopefully, hopefully suppress the hair growth on their forehead. Facial hair was removed, but body hair, that was left untouched. The Catholic Church also influenced the look. Growing your hair out was a feminine display until you went out in public and had long hair, then it was immodest. Because, of course. Number seven, mouse skin eyebrows. Okay, Stuart Little, if you're watching this, skip to number six. You don't want to see any of this, all right? Trust me, it's not good. Back in the 1800s, as I mentioned earlier, the cosmetic game was harsh, to say the least. The eyebrows, too, they had a rough go. Eyebrows were completely plucked off back then in order to make the forehead bigger. Yeah, you need that 1800s five head. That's the trick, apparently. Imagine if I shaved my eyebrows off and then painted my face like pale white. Honestly, I'd do it for the clicks. I'd do it for you guys. This five head look didn't last forever, thankfully, but for a hot minute, it almost got worse. In the late 17th century and early 18th century, these leading ladies would shave off their eyebrows and then they would glue on mouse skin to replace them. Like a band-aid, only horrible and stinky. Since their face was freshly painted and the glue game was weak, they would have one shot only to stick these puppies on. You just gotta eyeball it and hope that it works and that it looks in the right spot. I don't know. You put them on too low, you're gonna look upset all day long. Eyebrows are angry sisters, not angry twins, okay? Remember, number six, breast bags. Here's a neat term, breast bags. Let's bring that one back, see if it sticks. Now, contrary to what I just explained over at point number seven, women, more often than not, didn't wear undergarments in the Middle Ages. Up here, at least. But in 2008, at Austria's Langburn Castle, something that resembled a modern day bra was discovered. It's believed that only higher ups, ladies of nobility rather, were the only ones who had the privilege to wear these breast bags or breast cups. I say breast bags, sounds a little funnier. We have bags of milk in Canada, so you know, I'm connecting the, yeah, that's, that's, I gotta connect the jokes. I can't say much personally, but this does not look supportive enough at all. It's like a pirate flag, it's like ripped apart, this is nothing. If you have back problems, I don't think these breast bags are gonna help you. If you're ever catching up on some 13th century readings, well, now you have an image when you see the word breast bag. This, this eye patch that they called support. Number five, cesspools. Ooh, gross transition. If you're gonna make a massive castle, you need to know where to build certain rooms. Like say over a cesspool, for an example, that might be important. Just plug your nose. Cesspools were often placed under floors, which makes sense, because you know, you, you poop and then gravity and everything goes down. But you need to make sure that those floors are supportive enough. Because in 1183, the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire had a dinner in the palace of Erfurt, but the floor in the main hall broke open, resulting in a bunch of dinner guests falling through the floor, with a few of them even drowning in that cesspool. What a horrible way to go. Then again, in 1326 England, Richard the Raker had just sat down for dinner, guy hasn't even started his meal yet, and then again, the floor broke and he fell through and drowned. I'd say chamber pots were safer, definitely, but when it comes to waste, honestly, just out of sight, out of mind. Just get that away from me. Literally, pun intended. Number four, towels. I'm pretty picky when it comes to towels. I always have to have way too many just ready to go at all times. You know, in case I want a bath, in case I want to have two baths in a row, you never know. Today we have nicer towels at hotels than anything, honestly. We all know somebody with a Bahia Principe resort towel in their closet, and you're like, really? Really, you thief? Okay, I'm telling. Around the 1800s, flour sack towels were the best you'd get. Now, around this time, suppliers were packaging flour and other foods in these cotton sacks. This saved big time on barrels, and eventually they were cut into tea towels. Now, come the Great Depression, resources were of course limited, so these flour sacks were used now for multiple reasons. Clothing, toys, quilts, pillowcases, diapers, and of course, towels. Wouldn't feel too good on your back, not at all. Number three, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with an interesting method to getting rid of those pimples. Now, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, and physicians back then discussed pimples as such. Ready for this? They called them these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. 
But by squeezing said spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were referred to as maggots. That's what they thought they were back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots, thanks. No, no thank you, that's pretty horrible. That's a horrible reference. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. I would faint, I would be so sick. If a physician told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses anywhere on my body, I would throw up, I'd pass out, I'd be so upset. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah, you have common acne, hmm, maybe you're turning into a pigeon, who knows? Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds all to get rid of acne. Yeah, sounds like a horrible alternative. I would much rather just have acne. Maggots? Dude, I'm done with this channel. I'm out of here. That's so gross. Number two, unwanted hair. Pubic hair is a biological mystery, and yes, even after we hit puberty, we still can't figure it out. What are you? What's going on? So far, we believe this is part of our evolutionary history, and it comes from a time where we needed fur all over our bodies, right? Like animals. We evolved to protect ourselves against the cold, and just in general to keep that area, you know, safe. I don't know why I did that sound, but it's safe. So why is it that ancient Greek statues of women are completely hairless? Well, this was a time where if a woman's area was hair free, for some reason, the Greeks symbolized it as being pure. Okay. So in order to be considered pure, you'd have to use razors and creams, pumice stones, methods that were not as smooth as today. What's even more annoying is that men who would grow their body hair out, that was a sign of maturing. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not either of these categories. I can't grow anywhere where I want to. It's just bald, I'm just a bar of soap. Yeah, I'm not gonna use a stone to shave either. Thanks, we'll pass, next. And finally, coming in at number one, acne. Ancient Egyptians and Greeks came up with an interesting method of getting rid of those pimples. Now, reminder, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing. You ever click one of those videos and you're watching for like 40 minutes? You're like, I'm gonna be sick, is that yogurt? What is that? Physicians back then discussed these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. But by squeezing these mysterious spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then, so that's pretty horrible, that's gonna be in my head forever. They would refer to severe cases as maggots that lie in bed of roses, AKA your face, that's the bed of roses. If a physician told me I had maggots in my face, I'd faint. Teeth worms and maggots, like just brush your teeth and wash your face and then avoid all that smoke. These disorders were thought to be human skin taken on the properties of animals, so that's pretty wild. So ancient Greeks and Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds to solve that problem. Or what I just do is I just squeeze really hard, yell one curse word, and then wipe the mirror. That's usually how I do it. Number 10, wash your hands. No, seriously, go, go wash your hands right now. When was the last time you washed those filthy nests? Go wash your hands. Washing your hands is super important, especially these days. But something that's very unusual about the Aztecs compared to a lot of other civilizations in history is that, well, they did wash their hands. Oh, and you have no idea how happy that makes me. No more shall I have to think about people shaking hands after using the bathroom with no toilet paper. That's disgusting. Or scooping food onto a plate with their bare, dirty hands and sharing that food with the rest of their families. Yes, the Aztecs like to wash their hands before and after a meal, which is just the way it should be. I hate having grimy hands. You know, I talked to the chief today, and you know what he said? That's it, that's actually it. Yeah, we like that, that's it. Number nine, Aztec Barbershop. It must have been quite the sight for Spanish conquistadors to land upon the shores of North America and then come to bear witness the Aztec civilization in all its glory. Something noticed by the curious Europeans was that the Aztecs had what looked like a barbershop for men. After all, a healthy scalp is a happy one. Even more interesting than that, however, is women were dyeing their hair with a green herb that I'm not even going to begin to pronounce. It was just too hard. It was a lot of X's and T's. I couldn't do it. Which produced a purple shine to their hair. Some women even shaved their hair off, while older women, like mothers, had longer hair. Man, it's almost as if a beautiful civilization was starting to flourish. Well, I'm sure nothing bad ever happens to the Aztecs, right? Number eight. My heroes. Let me create a scenario for you. I like creating scenarios. Let me create a scenario for you. You're on the way to a certain event that is very important in the big city. Maybe it's a new job, a new summer fling, or something that requires dry pants. 
but now your stomach is acting up. It's big angie. Your stomach's making sounds that are becoming more audible and you can feel soon you will require a bathroom. But you hold it in. I can make it past this event and then go, you say to yourself, no problem. But now you've got cramps, sweats, and you're getting anxious as you know that DEF CON 1 is approaching. You now have to make a decision to make a rush to find a bathroom or be late for your event or take a gamble with your underwear and dignity. Yes, that is a feeling I know all too well, but perhaps I should have been living in the Aztec Empire as they had public washrooms all over the city. That's just awesome. Oh, what sweet relief. As if that weren't the most unusual, they also had citizens cleaning the streets, which is pretty unusual for the time. Yes, cleanliness was very important to the Aztecs, and honestly, I think there should be public toilets on every street corner. Please, sometimes I gotta go. Number seven, public bathhouse. Okay, this next one, we haven't really moved on that much. We still bathe together, we still do it in like water parks, we swim in pools of pee pee, and then go down slides and burn our back skin off. Ancient Roman, <laughs> so great, you're like, why'd you have to ruin it? Ancient Roman bathhouses were the older, yuckier versions of these water parks. They also didn't have slides, so. Boo. They would literally spread intestinal parasites in these houses, pools, in these massive rooms with massive pools. The Romans were figuring out sewage systems at the same time, which I'll talk more about later, gladly, but they were also the first to create heated public baths. My above ground pool wasn't even heated, but the ancient Romans were. Now I'm upset. I'm gonna call my dad after this. The archaeology and anthropology department at Cambridge discovered that Romans brought lots of parasites to Europe. Fossilized species show that these heated, relaxing, rejuvenating bathhouses in your body were all but. I don't mean to undermine the ancient Romans though, it's not what I'm doing, okay? To be fair, they also brought lice and fleas. Number six, ye olde dentistry. Look, every time I find a decent dentistry fact, I slap that bad boy in here like a D-based infomercial host with a surprisingly effective kitchen gadget. You're gonna love my nuts, remember that guy? This is just one of those facts. Do I have a fear of the dentist? No. No, I don't, because my dentist is nice and has all the modern amenities to make me feel at ease. A comfy chair, laughing gas, and putting Peppa Pig on the TV because I'm a big baby. Goo goo gaga. However, no amount of any of those things I mentioned can prepare you for the dentistry before the year 1900. It was crude to say the least, but hygiene is hygiene, and you gotta keep that mouth fresh and clean. Tooth infections were fixed with rubbing charcoal in the affected area, and if that wasn't enough, a super safe mixture of snake venom and vinegar was used. What? I, okay. Who was the first guy that discovered snake venom had such healing properties? Probably the same weirdo who first milked a cow, if I had to guess. Aztec dentistry included fillings and tooth removal as well. Also, ladies of the evening dyeing their teeth distinct colors, so then you know if you know. You know? Look at my red teeth, boys. Number five, steam baths. Now looking back and learning that the Aztecs had public washrooms everywhere and had access to steam baths because of their irrigation is fantastic. I mean, come on, just think about it. You could relax after a long day in your own steam bath that's made by natural running water. It sounds like doing yoga there would make me feel more in touch with my inner chakras. And my mood crystals would glow just a little bit brighter. Imagine, you walk into a bathhouse after a long day, and then you see me just sitting there with a towel that barely fits. Well, hey there, good looking. Why don't you come on in and pop a squat next to me? I promise I don't hog all the steam. <laughs> I know it sounds like an amazing time, right? The more we talk about the Aztecs, the more they sound like a perfect society. I wonder what happened to them. I'm sure it was nothing bad. They gotta be out there somewhere. Move over, fellas, I'm coming in for the steam. The steam was thought to have healing properties and was connected to their spirituality. Women even gave birth in the steam rooms, which feels like a really sweaty time. I just, I don't know about that. It's a lot of sweat. Number four, Bath and Body Works. It's clear the Aztecs were just cleaner than the other civilizations of the past, and honestly, I'm here for it. There's only so much a guy can say about people being stinky in the past. I mean, really, the smell must have been horrible, especially down in the nether regions. My lady, I would like to have a child with you, but the fragrance that is coming from both of our undercarriages makes me want to get into my carriage and drive it into the nearest body of water. Yes. Aztecs were making soap like it was their day job, using various herbs and plants to create much nicer smells and perfumes. However, during the rainy months, Aztecs wouldn't wash or wash their clothes in penance. But I guess one month isn't so bad. Strangely enough, women wouldn't wash their faces when men went off to war. 
I'm not sure about that one, but hey, I'll take it. Gold star for staying clean, Aztecs. Gold star. Number three, grow it out. In the old west era of the United States, men often grew their hair long as a practical choice rather than a cool fashion statement. You know what I mean? All those bandits with their long hair, they had to. Living in the rugged and often isolated terrain of the west, men had to perform many physically demanding tasks like hunting, ranching, mining, pouring whiskey drinks and tarantula juice. Long hair would help protect their scalp and neck from the sun and wind and all that good stuff. But it's important to note that haircuts were not always easily accessible back then. And many men back then could not afford them or did not have access to a barber. It's like, I can't cut it. It's like, where? We don't have anything. We don't have dental. What do we do? As a result, growing their hair long became a practical and functional choice for many men back in the old west rather than, you know, style. And they were going for looks back then. They weren't doing man buns, doing the cowboy thing. They're like, no, I have bugs. I don't want you to see my bugs. I'm going to grow it. Thanks. Number two, the Aztec classic. I'm glad the Aztec had better hygiene because for once I don't get super queasy talking about the things people did. However, it wouldn't be a video about Aztecs if I didn't talk about their favorite pastime. Sacrifice. And honey, if they were given out gold medals for it, the Aztecs would be record breakers. Sure, they weren't the only civilization to sacrifice people, but they did it with such theatrics. It would make my old theater teacher very proud. But unlike most civilizations, the Aztecs did this all the time. Whenever the calendar called for one, it was time for one. And if they ran out of people, they would go grocery shopping for more. Or actually just go to war and take people, which is not good. Just know that when a chief or a religious leader cuts the heart out of a man whilst alive for the entire city to see, he most likely had a clean cloth and water to wash his hands, making modern surgeons proud everywhere. Number one, the European bug. It's safe to say that Aztecs, while not as clean as people today, they were striving for better hygiene, more than any other civilization at the time, really. However, no amount of hand washing, sacrificing, or putting herbs in your bath can prepare them for the Spanish. Not just the swords and the guns and invading and such, no, I mean the sickness that Europeans brought with them. It's a plot similar to War of the Worlds, except the invaders brought all the nasties with them. No matter what the Aztecs did, it wasn't going to stop the waves of lovely things the Europeans brought over. Armpits are clean, but now they got black lungs. There's too many diseases to even name, there's a lot. Kicking off the list at number 10, Karem Lu. It's the 1930s, you're looking for a way to get rid of those upper lip hairs. Well, Karem Lu promises to have your back. They actually promise to have your armpits as well. Yeah, armpit hair and upper lip hair, gone. For good, you say? Wow, that sounds absolutely lovely. Just don't read the fine print, don't flip it and zoom in. Don't zoom in. This cream was applied to the upper lip, but side effects caused hair loss all over your body. And sometimes users would suffer from paralysis. It was on the market for $10, which back in the 1930s, that's a lot, a lot, a lot. Like for hair removal cream, that's a lot, a lot. Those are like Beats headphones, what is this? The Journal of the American Medical Association called this product out as viciously dangerous. Rightfully so, and those who suffered from those harsh side effects collectively sued the company into bankruptcy come 1932. The silent killer here in the cream was thallium, commonly used as rat poison. That ought to do it. Number nine, ancient birth control. Although birth control today is easier than in ancient times, it's still a chore. It's routine, it's something you have to keep track of daily, and things go wrong if you don't and lose track. There's a plethora of side effects. You have to take fake ones just so your body, what, your hormones are all over the place. You can get cancer from these, you can get blood clots potentially. There's really, there's very little research on long-term effects for birth control pills. And also I'm speaking not from experience. There's no birth control pill for guys. This is wildly unfair. I have the most respect. These pills mess you up. My friends will tell me their side effects and I can't believe it. You're all troopers. Ancient Egyptians, their method of ancient birth control was by mixing acacia fruit with honey and ground dates. This paste would then be used directly and believe it or not, it was rather effective. Acacia gum ferments and then turns into lactic acid, which can prevent pregnancy. Not all of these ancient methods worked like this. There's another that's really bizarre and I'll save that for the end. It's absolutely insane, I can't believe it. We'll ease our way there, you know, we'll, we'll start nice. Number eight, Lash Lure. Turning the calendars back to 1933, the year FM radios and drive-in movie theaters were introduced and as well as the horrifying and deadly mascara, Lash Lure. 
This 1930s cosmetic contained a chemical, P-phenylidamine. That's how you know it's bad, when you can't even pronounce the thing. This mascara left blisters all over your face, your eyelids, the whole thing. It was really bad. There was eventually a death in 1933. One woman sadly developed an infection, a bacterial infection, and then passed away. It was so bad that later that year, her before and after photos were used in an FDA display titled The Chamber of Horrors. It was a horrible incident, but a good way to get the attention from higher ups so something like this never happens again. Lash Lure was then the first product in history that was removed from stores entirely, so it worked. We're in the middle of something kind of similar now, I think. Cigarette packages have those horrible side effects to smoking right there on the packaging. The girl with the face. Could we see the day smoking is outlawed? I don't know, I feel like we're close. It's caused quite a few more deaths than Lash Lure. Number seven, pucker up. Hey, on this channel, we've talked about some crazy stuff in history, and a lot of crazy stuff unfortunately had a lot to do with women being hugely mistreated in the past. However, some women acted against this. I'd give specific reasons for wanting to get back to the patriarchy, but I'd be here all day. One woman came up with a devious plan, a way to remove the stinky men from her life and to get away with it too. Introducing Aqua Tofana. It was an odorless, colorless poison that was slow acting and would resemble side effects of a sickness, or at least a common sickness at the time. It was marketed as a cosmetic. Women could wear this on their cheek and when the big hunk of a man came in for a kiss, well, it was probably one of the last things he would ever do. The main ingredients were arsenic and nightshade, which, if you didn't know, is very poisonous. Next time you forget to take the trash out at night, gentlemen, just take notice of when the wife wants to give you a kiss. It could be your last. Number six, Gorad's Cream. Once advertised as a magic beautifier, doesn't that sound like a neat time? Gorad's Oriental Cream hit the market back in 1936. This cream was supposed to freshen up your skin, make you look lighter, younger, whatever Paul Rudd's doing, whatever his secret is, we're still trying to figure that one out. That sort of thing. But instead, this skin cream had one user ending up in a book that's very Chamber of Horrors style. This magic ingredient that was meant to magically make you beautiful had some magic mercury in it. Not something you want on your face, yeah, at all. The results were haunting. This woman had soon developed black gums, her teeth loosened, and dark rings appeared around her eyes and even her neck. Mercury poisoning is not fun. Number five, moss. We're halfway through and I'll say it again. I'll remind you all again, I have the utmost respect for you ladies. As a guy doing this list and like writing this list, I mean the things you had to craft back then and then, you know, put, oh my lord. For example, going back to the 10th century, this was a time long before Tampax was ever even a thing. Women were forced to get creative when it came to personal hygiene. They had to just figure it out themselves and literally collect grass or moss, sheepskin lined with cotton. It was mostly moss all the time. You all are absolute troopers. If it wasn't moss, other solutions were small pieces of wood with lint wrapped around it. Number four. Q-tips. If you haven't heard, Q-tips are not for your ears. Yeah, I thought this was a rumor. Turns out we're all lawbreakers. I use two at the same time if I'm in a rush. No, flip them. I'm a vigilante when it comes to Q-tips. Q-tips were invented in 1923 by Leo Gertzenzang, right after his wife stuck cotton balls to the end of a toothpick. Kinda sounds like his wife invented Q-tips, but okay, we'll roll with it. From 1923 to 1926, they were named Baby Gays, and then Q-Tip Baby Gays, and then finally just Q-Tips. That's like a Sweet Baby Rays, that barbecue sauce. Oh, so good. If they just called it Sweet Rays, maybe they gave it up to the baby, I don't know. You have to try and work it out. I don't know what the bit is, but I'm like, hey, that's a great sauce, and I just thought of that sauce. Baby Rays, Baby Gays. Back in those days, Q-Tips were dipped in boric acid, and they were intended to sterilize wounds. Yeah, we're just out here like, my eyes roll back every time. I get so deep, I go way too deep. I get too deeper, I'm like, oh, it's gone. Huh, there it is, magic, I'm a magician. After this, there were even Q-soaps, Q-oils, Q-creams. It's like Apple, like I iPad, iPhone, the other eye stuff. So what's this rumor that they're not supposed to be in your ears? What's that about? Well, in 2008, Dennis Fitzgerald brought forward concerns about Q-tips and how they're really pushing earwax into your ear canal, leading to possible infections more than anything. When Cheesebro Ponds bought the company back in 1962, they added a warning on the box, a warning that we and I gladly still ignore. Just talking about this, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go clean my stuff out. Mm. I have Q-tips in my bag, literally, I'm always prepared. Always strapped. Number three, Red Dead Bandage. America, 1864. 
There's a polite disagreement between North and South whether the South should be still using YouTube's least favorite S word as a business practice. The verdict? It wasn't very nice. That aside, the Southern states fought hard for a very stupid reason. Idiots. Such a hard fight in the fact that it was taking a serious toll on everyone. Specifically the southern economy and civilians who got caught in the raw end of the deal. The war was a huge cost of life and money for both sides, but the south just didn't have the same resources the north did. So after years of fighting, things weren't looking too good. An example of this was the south washing and reusing bandages as supplies were low and casualties were high. This might be hard to stomach, but that's just what happened. Nurses washed the blood off of blood soaked rags and bandages to reuse simply because there was no supply. I don't have to be a doctor to tell you that reusing bandages in a time before antibiotics is a bad idea. It might be better to just not have a bandage in that case at all, as the chance for infection would significantly increase. Dutch, you got any fresh band aids over there? I scraped my knee fight with Micah. Hurts real bad. Maybe get John to kiss my boo boo better. Number two. Aqua Tofana. Going back to the 1600s for this one. Also, if you're a murderino, you'll enjoy this bit of dark history. Aqua Tofana was a cosmetic that was sold to women in the early 1630s. It was a cosmetic that doubled as a poison. Yeah, <laughs> sneaky, right? Some Assassin's Creed shit going on here. The origins of this deadly cosmetic that was sold and responsible for around like 600 deaths is pretty wild. So back in 1632, two women, Francesca Lasarda and Teofana Diamato, they both created this poison. They worked together and created it so that when their husbands kissed them on the cheek, they would then be poisoned. But eventually Teofana was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe carried on through her daughter, Yulia Tofana. She took this deadly recipe to Rome and then kept manufacturing it. Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and belladonna. Colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. And finally coming in at number one, more ancient birth control. Okay, we kicked this list off catching up with ancient Egyptians and the uh, aid of acacia trees and all that jazz. So I figured we'd end on a ridiculous birth control method from the ancient Roman days. Serranus, who was known as a Greek gynecologist back then, his idea for Planned Parenthood was not a good one. It was not a good idea. He wrote that after you, you know, bump uglies, in order to prevent pregnancy, the woman must squat and sneeze. First of all, no, not a chance, no, no. And also, if you're thinking about it, no. Secondly, who can sneeze on demand? I certainly can't. I had a really nice time tonight, cheers. That's not, that's not possible, no. Many methods from the past are questionable. In ancient China, it was commonly told that drinking hot mercury could prevent pregnancy. Yeah, leave mercury away from your body, that will literally kill you. Ancient Greeks would drink blacksmith water because they too thought the exposure to lead could prevent getting pregnant. This idea came back around World War I as well. Women were working in factories and actually trying to get exposed to lead. That was the whole idea. Bad. These are pretty dark, so I'll leave you on this one. In the Dark Ages, European women wore amulets made of weasel testicles to magically ward off pregnancies. Poor weasels. Black magic is the worst, isn't it? Number 10, the forbidden toothpaste. If I looked into your bathroom right now, what would I see? Oh, uh, you forgot to flush the toilet. If it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. Seems you've forgotten your own golden rule there. What I was actually looking at was for a flavor of toothpaste that you had. Classic mint, maybe you got cinnamon. Maybe you go for the whole bamboo toothbrush charcoal toothpaste vibe. Hey, I respect it, good on you for making better choices. But bad on the Aztecs for making gross choices. Ever look at some forbidden lemonade and think, hey, add some salt to this. And now we got ourselves a bona fide toothpaste? Of course you didn't, because you ain't a crazy person. Or at least I hope you're not. But yeah, Aztecs used to brush their teeth with an unholy mixture of golden broth, pee, and salt. Yeah, I. why would you add salt to pee? I, I think it cleans teeth, sure. You just have to borrow an Egyptian breathman after. It's no big deal, it's fine. It's good for your teeth, it's fine. Number nine, high stakes. Any good game of a sport will have you at the edge of your seat and dropping all cheese flavored snacks around you just so you can keep your eyes glued to the screen. The Aztecs did not have access to such finger licking good things like Doritos, but what they did have was a sport that was very high stakes. Maybe too high actually. As if you didn't win, it could very well cost you your life. A game called, here we go, Chris is gonna like me pronouncing this, called Omalazitli. With its nine pound rubber ball and eye shaped court, 
players had to pass the ball through a small stone ring. This game was taken very seriously, like ritual serious, and you didn't want to be on the losing side as it may cost you your head. Yes, even sports events in modern times have gotten violent, sure. But if we started lopping off heads for our losses, well, Tom Brady would have a lot more blood on his hands, wouldn't he? Number eight, hot chocolate. As a Canadian, I cannot tell you how important the medicinal qualities that are a hot chocolate on a wet, cold winter's day. You've been slipping and sliding down a snow hill for hours, and your snow pants are soaking wet, partially from the snow and also because your dad made you go down the super scary hill and it was too much for you. Don't tell mom. Hot chocolate was important for the Aztecs too. More so just chocolate, actually. It was used for a number of things. First off, after the beans have been roasted, they smell amazing. So it most likely went into some perfumes and other lovely smelling things that they used. It was also used as currency, strangely enough. And it was also, also, also used as a ritual drink. Except they didn't exactly have sugar, so they used other things, other ingredients like peppers, and other unusual flavor enhancers to for chocolate. I don't, the pepper, I, I never understood that. People are like, it's hot, like Mexican hot chocolate. It's, it's pepper and chocolate. It's a weird, hot, cho hot spicy chocolate. Not a, not a fan. Not a fan. Number seven, ear scoops. When I think of all the things I use a scoop for, I think of ice cream and sugar for my tea. Well now, I'm gonna be thinking about how people in the Viking era, all the way to the later post-Tudor times, used to scoop out their own earwax. Yes, an ear scoop was a tiny little brass or copper spoon with a twisted handle that went to a point. The spoon part was used for scooping, while the pointed end was used for pooping. No, I just wanted to say that. It was actually used for cleaning the fingernails of dirt. Thanks, ear scoops. Now I'm never going to look at a spoon the same way again. Man. Number six, end times. We all know what ancient civilizations are like with predicting the future, or more specifically, predicting the end times. Mayans thought everything was going to fade to black in 2012. Didn't, did it? Some people really thought this was going to happen. I always thought that Buddy just didn't get around to finishing the thing, but hey, whatever works. Well, if it was real, why didn't the world end? Well, the Aztec answer to that was the new fire ceremony. Another ceremony, why not? Basically, every once in a while, things got a little crazy. It was a time to cleanse, a spring cleaning, if you will. People stopped working, destroyed household items, and at the end of a five-day cycle, some priests would take a dude up a volcano and toss him in there like I toss away bad report cards from my mother. All this to prevent the end of the world. Virus, act of God, bad hygiene. Whatever it was, just good old-fashioned blanket solution. Nice. Number five, bread and entertainment. Hygiene is health, and health is mental health. And that means after a long day, you need entertainment. That's why you came here, hopefully. They say that after bread comes entertainment. I feel the same. Where would my generation be if not for the ability to rewatch The Office infinitely? Aztecs have been theatrical killers, sure, but they also had a soft spot for the arts. During their crazy spring cleaning festival to save the world, you may just find the Aztecs enjoying music and poetry. Some of the poetry even survived the downfall of the Aztecs and is around today. I'd recite it, but I would need some help from Chris to help sound things out. I wonder if they had a poem for a stranger that comes from a faraway land to take all our golden riches away. Hmm. Number four, more than one way to skin a cat. Here I am talking about Aztecs, and that means I gotta talk about how bloodthirsty they were. Seriously, it's good they washed their hands because with the amount of blood on them, well, I don't have a joke for that. They just kind of got crazy with it. It's estimated that 20,000 people a year perish to sacrifice. That's that's way too many, dude. That's that's wrong. Which, if I'm being honest, those numbers probably could have helped you fight off the Spanish when they, they came to take everything. But what do I know? Cutting the heart out of people while they were still alive, a lot of heads no longer attached to bodies, and something that's just so heinous. Texas Chainsaw fans rejoice because the Aztecs loved a good skinning. Just a good old pea fashion. Peel skin off them. Just take it off, George. George, take your skin off. I don't know why Jerry Seinfeld's skinning somebody, but sure. What do they do with the skins afterward? Do they throw them into the crowd and they cheer it on? Or, cause that's, that, that's just wrong, man. That's not right. That's wrong, bruv. The chief was so upset by this one that he had nothing to say, actually. The chief is speechless. He's got nothing. Prepared to be baffled by eyelash extensions. How could they ever be illegal or dangerous? I'm willing to get. I'm willing to bet, guess that brains jump to glues, or maybe the lashes 
band being made of something poisonous. Wrong and wrong. Be ready to yak, this one's rough. So tales of eyelash extensions in Britain seem to have been spawned by an 1882 news snippet by Henry LaBush in The Truth, which is referred to as the popularity of this procedure amongst Parisian beauties. Here is some of the snippet for you from the Dundee Courier, July 6, 1899, that describes the procedure. Be ready to fast forward if you're the queasy type. So, if your eyes are unattractive, you may make them irresistible by transplanting hair. Sounds all right. There's specialists who make a handsome living out of the process of transplanting hair from the head to the eyebrows or the eyelash. Let me jump ahead to the through the Shakespeare talk here. Ah, okay. An ordinary fine needle is threaded with a long hair genuinely taken from the head of the person being operated on. The lower border of the eyelid is then thoroughly cleaned and in order for the process to be as painless as possible, rubbed with a solution of cocoa, not the hot chocolate one, the white one. The operator then, by a few skillful touches, runs his needle through the extreme edges of the eyelid, in and out along the edge of the eye, leaving hair threads in loops of carefully graduated length. Most of the hairs have been translit, planted, take root and grow, but a few fall out. I've hated every second of that, so let's just move on. Number two, get your money right. Any good accountant will tell you that treating your portfolio like good hygiene is a good idea. Go for multiple smells or invest in multiple things. Check out what's on the market. Might be a new perfume, maybe a new stock. And while you're at it, dump a huge investment into fart bucks. Okay, well, maybe not that accountant, but believe it or not, the Aztecs were great accountants and had good records of pretty much everything, which is unusual because most cultures in Mesoamerica just just didn't. And with the amount of gold and riches that the Aztecs had accumulated over time, it was kind of necessary. So you can understand that when the Spanish showed up, they were salivating at the sight of all the treasure that did not belong to them because Hernan Cortez was going to take it. Hand it over, you nice smelling weirdos. Number one, why doubt it? Through everything the Aztecs went through or did, it all came down to a fever uh, and a cough and many other symptoms, actually. All of their triumphs and losses, all their sacrifices, and all the times they tried to fend off the Spanish. Futile compared to their fight against the sicknesses that the Spanish had brought over. Once there was a patient zero, it was pretty much all over. As good as their roots and medical herbs were at healing, ain't nothing gonna cure that black lung. If it can do what it did to a big handsome cowboy, then it can do the same to everyday people. <laughs> Dutch, <laughs> we got the Aztecs sick again, Dutch. <laughs> I got some chocolate though. Hope you like corn in your chocolate, Dutch. <laughs> Number 10, no lice. You know in elementary school when they would check everyone for lice and one poor sucker had to get their head shaved and walk around as that bald kid for like a month and would probably get bullied? Well that ain't gonna happen back in ancient Egypt because everyone shaved their heads to avoid lice back then and priests would shave their whole bodies just like Michael Phelps. Instead of having actual hair of their own they would wear wigs. Wigs sometimes made of human hair. That honestly was a lot better in that harsh desert sun. Lice and other little pests like that, like fleas, were not wanted. And yeah, they still aren't, but it led to some honestly interesting solutions. For example, a warm potion of date meal and water was believed to drive away fleas and lice. They would use cat's fat to keep away mice, I made a rhyme, and one that probably actually did something was when they used a solution of natron water and salt in their humble abodes to eliminate and repel fleas. Number nine, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over. I burn so easily. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day, all night, and feel like I'm about to faint, obviously. Canada gets quite hot. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? What was their trick? They didn't have banana breeze, FPF, SPF 90, whatever the hell it is. Ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty, right? You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work? Think again, Laura. Their routine was written on tomb walls and scrolls. Rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol was used to block the sun off. Yeah, it was that hard. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. And ancient Greeks as well, they used olive oil as sunscreen as well as ancient Egyptians. Which as far as UV protection goes, it did absolutely nothing. You'd be burnt and extremely dehydrated, but also you'd have some nice tan lines and you wouldn't be as pale as me, so it wasn't all bad. Number eight, the finest of cosmetics. The cosmetics of ancient Egypt were not just for looking good, they were for feeling good too. Like on the inside. Now, as such, those professionals who made the stuff took it pretty seriously. 
Not just because of a passion for the art, but also because they'd be judged pretty damn harshly if they did a bad job. If they sucked, it would mean having the whole neighborhood give you a bad reputation. And in the cosmetics business, just like show business, it's all about that reputation. It would also mean some harsh judgment from the big boys upstairs, meaning the gods when you met the afterlife. So yeah, they wanted to do a good job. And to meet that end, they would try and use the finest of ingredients, as they should when people have to put this stuff on their skins and right next to their eyes and stuff. In seventh place, we have the use of copper. So copper apparently has many benefits for the skin, one of which is that it can help to heal wounds and scars along with having anti-aging properties. Ancient Egyptians used a lot of copper for their skin. And according to modern dermatologists, copper peptides are well known in the skincare world. So apparently I've been hiding under some sort of rock. They improve skin, including firmness, smoothness and reduction of fine lines and wrinkles by promoting collagen, elastin, and improved antioxidant activity. Just a little note though, too much copper intake can make you nauseous and give you gastrointestinal issues or, you know, cause serious organ system toxicity. Good news, I'm not going to freak out my gold loving dad today by replacing silver with copper as my favorite metal. Honest to goodness, even just choosing to have fake silver ornaments on my Christmas tree over gold last year almost started a full blown argument in Canadian Tire. It was a whole thing. Number six, get this man a TikTok or something. Just like I use mints to cure my nasty tea breath, which I argue is worse than coffee breath, the ancient Egyptians used breath mints to keep things fresh. Honestly, they actually sound kind of good. Frankincense, cinnamon, melon, pine seeds and cashews put together, ground up and bound together in candy using honey. <laughs> Just heat that bad boy over the fire and let it cool and boom, breath mints. I like it. I like it a lot. These breath mints would be made commercially by those fine cosmeticians and dentists. Or they could even be made at home. Some archaeological finds of bowls, jars, and other dishes suggest that they may have been candy dishes that would hold the lovely taste in little suckers. Always gotta keep things fun, fresh, and flirty back in ancient Egypt. Breath mints would certainly help you do the trick. <laughs> nice. Number five, loincloths. Going back to ancient Roman and also ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Either that or you would just be naked. I found this neat step-by-step -step online on how to make your own loincloth, because that's apparently what I do on my free time. Thank you for asking. And it's a bit more complicated than I thought. It's way more, it's way more complicated than just throwing on sweatpants or even, you know, the towel fold like a toga. This had numerous steps. We don't have a lot of archaeological evidence because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time. But ancient Romans would use leather to make underwear. That's a fun little fact right there. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the hot sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but I'll let Adam tell you about that one another time. That's more of a, that's more of a home one. Number four, food as medicine. Trying to prevent bad things before they happen, it is a very human skill to have. And when it comes to preventative medicine, the Egyptians had some methods. One more obvious solution is diet. Eating the right stuff truly does help lead to a longer life, but eating the specific right stuff can directly prevent certain issues. As a prime example, the laborers that would build the massive iconic structures we know Egypt for today were kept fed with diets that include a lot of onion, garlic, and radishes. Now, I don't know if the ancient Egyptians knew the chemicals these foods contained, or if they just put two and two together, but onions, garlic, and radishes contain, why did I do this to myself, contain allostatin, allicin, and raffinin which are very helpful when it comes to preventing diseases in the super crowded working and living conditions the laborers existed in. That allicin really helps. Another example would be to cure night blindness. In these circumstances, doctors fed their patients powdered liver, which is rich in vitamin A, which is a vital nutrient for vision. Again, I don't know if they knew it contained that specific fang or if they were just like, hmm, I eat liver and I can see better. Discovery! Number three, same clothes, new day. King James, and no, I don't mean LeBron, I mean King James VI of Scotland this time around. We'll talk about him another time. He had a pretty sweet idea when it came to changing clothes. You don't. Simple as that. What a dream, right? The amount of times I change my shirt every day for literally no reason, it's such a waste of time. It's like black, mm, gray, mm, black, yeah, that's it. It's a waste of time. King James would wear the same clothes for months at a time, even wearing the same hat for 24 hours straight. He was devoted to the hat game. He just slept like, didn't move a muscle. He went as far as not bathing either because he thought that it was bad for his health. 
yeah, things were thought differently back then, as you may have known by now on this channel. James became king when he was just 13 months old and he succeeded Mary, Queen of Scots. In 1603, he took over as ruler for both England, Scotland, and Ireland for 22 years. And he looked the same every day. Gotta, gotta love it. Who's committed? Number two, eye makeup. Almost everybody and their mums knows that the Egyptians wore that crazy awesome eye makeup. But what you might not know is that it didn't just serve the purpose of making you look absolutely stunning. No, a lot of these eye makeups were lead based. Now, that sounds pretty bad. I can't lie. It does. And it likely was for some. But it was possible that it boosted nitric oxide by up to 240% in cultured human skin cells. I don't know what cultured human skin cells means, but that's the quote. If you know, let me know down below. What the heck does nitric oxide do? Well, that I do know. It helps to boost up your immune system to fight diseases, which, guess what? That's pretty important, especially in the marshy areas around the Nile, where eye infections are actually pretty darn common. What's cool is that research suggests the Egyptians actually knew that, and specifically synthesized the makeup for this purpose. Huh. Neat. Finally, number one, mummification. Back in the day, mummification was common, and even today we're finding more mummies. Like, literally last month, we just unraveled six more. It's crazy. We're uncovering more ancient history, which is great, but how exactly was this process done? We're talking about back maggots and stuff. What, what did they think about this? How did this even begin a, to be a thing? Well, it wasn't cheap for starters. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. It's a pretty brutal process as well. What you would do is you would put a hook, or well, they would put a hook in your nose after you'd passed away, and then they would pull out your brain and all that just squishy stuff, just out all through this thing right here. And then they would cut the left side of the stomach open, remove all those goods, all the organs, boom, see ya, gone. And while those are drying, you would put your lungs and liver in jars. And then you would put the heart back in the body and then you would wash the insides out with wine and spices all that stuff turpentine turpentines all the time and teens just all in there washing it out then you'd cover the body in salt for 70 days that's a long time but around day 40 you would stuff it with sand now come day 70 finally that's when you wrap them in the mummy bandages then the sarcophagus awaits forever really and then there's just jars of organs also stored in your burial chamber now it's, we don't do it, it's not as fun anymore. We don't put our organs in jars. We don't stuff anyone with sand. We should, you know what? We should bring I back mummies. Let's just do should. it. I think it's time. Yeah. Kicking off our list at number 10, seam squirrels. I love squirrels. Being Canadian, we see quite a bit of them. They're a little too friendly for me at times, but they're great. During the old west era, seam squirrels were, well, not what you think. Personal hygiene was not a priority for many people back then, obviously, and lice infestations were unfortunately quite common. Now, the type of lice that affected people during this time was commonly known as body lice, which is pretty horrible. That could be found in the seams of clothing, hence the term seam squirrels. Yeah, not actually a squirrel at all. It's just body lice. Gotcha. Body lice, of course, was a major problem during the Old West era, and they were responsible for the spread of diseases like typhus, trench fever, and Relapsing fever, relapsing fever. I haven't even heard of that one. That's terrible. These diseases were often fatal because you know ye old west, and many people in the old west succumbed to them. To combat the spread of lice and the you know one of many diseases that they carried, people in the old west often resorted to extreme measures such as burning their clothing or even shaving their heads completely. That's why you see old cowboys and they look like they're stressed. They have no hair. Their clothes are just gone. You're like, what happened? Lice. Lice happened. Some people also used remedies like vinegar and kerosene to try and kill the lice, so yeah, it was a rough time either way. Overall, lice infestations were a significant health concern during the Old West era, and they played a significant role in the spread of disease. Yeah, it wasn't just rats in the medieval era, it was also lice, which is even grosser in my opinion. Number nine, Old West Dental. I could use some Old West Dental recently. I got a, I'm chewing on one side right now, you know what I mean? In the Old West, dental hygiene was not a priority for everyone. They couldn't afford it. And also, dental care was often very sparse. You couldn't really find it anywhere, for that matter. People generally didn't have access to modern dental tools or products, and many did not have regular access to any dentists at any point in their life, which is a sad but real fact. That would suck, I'm terrified. However, there were some basic dental hygiene practices that people in the Old West may have followed to keep their teeth, you know, somewhat in their heads, you know, keep their gums not rotten. Didn't do much, but did something. There were toothbrushes. 
Not many, but you know, wasn't as good as Oral B. There's some stuff. More often than not, you'd have to use twigs or chew on mint, that kind of natural survivor stuff. Some people may have also used a cloth or a rag to rub their teeth clean. Yeah, don't forget your tooth cloth before you go on vacation, I guess. You gotta and then put it back in your pocket. Your old woody teeth, gotta rub those. Access to professional dental care was limited in the Old West. Some towns, some, had dentists, but all they did back then was just pull out the problem. They didn't give you a crown. They're like, which one hurts? All right, get out of here. All without anesthesia. So that's a great time. You're gonna remember all of it. Other options included a community toothbrush, which is hilarious to think about and also so sad. Yeah, some public establishments had a public toothbrush. Can you imagine? Go out, have a little brush, check your teeth. All right, cool. I'm gonna go back to the bar. I'm gonna be sick. I'm gonna actually throw up right now. Number eight, no spitting. Spitting was a common habit back in the Old West. You see it in movies and parodies. They're always spitting on the ground and stuff. Well, it's because it's real. It's a real fact right there. It wasn't a officially outlawed. However, many towns and cities did prohibit spitting on sidewalks and inside of public buildings because yeah, please don't do that. Thank you so much, sir. This was largely due to concerns about hygiene and of course, like I said earlier, the spread of disease. In addition, spitting was considered rude and uncivilized behavior. Yeah, of course, and many people were offended by it. Middle of conversation, guy just spits in between your feet. I'm like, wait, don't do that. Please don't do that ever again. Some businesses even had signs asking customers to not spit on the floor. Can you imagine what kind of sh hole you're in? You have to ask people not to do that. There was also social norms in place that discouraged spitting in certain situations. For example, it was considered impolite to spit in the presence of a woman or in formal settings, which, yeah, I agree, still do that today. That's great. Despite these efforts to discourage spitting, it remained a common practice among cowboys, miners, and other workers in ye old West. They're like, yeah, I have shit in my mouth. I don't know, we don't have water. I'm gonna spit, sorry. Number seven, ancient cosmetics. The ancient Egyptians in particular were known for their good hygiene. They were, as we have seen, bathed frequently and even wore makeup. The ancient Greeks had a similar reputation and emphasized the benefits of a healthy diet. Egyptian cosmetics and toiletry sets actually included a tube for the eye cosmetic coal, a razor, tweezers, a whetstone, and a mirror. As far as back as the ancient Roman period, women were have to said to use razors. There, they would also have been found tweezers, stones, as well as creams, which were used to remove hair. In Tudor England, it was said that people cared about their appearances, and so people took into carrying little glass or steel mirrors with them and also carry tweezers as well as combs, ear scoops, and bone manicure sets. There's evidence that people have been shaving since the early days of man and it is believed that they had used sharpened rocks to scrape away facial hair and some may have actually removed facial hair by plucking it. Number six, hair care? Yeah, I added a question mark there because, I don't know, not much TLC going on on top back then. Throughout history, people have used a variety of natural ingredients for hair care. Nowadays, guys have it too easy. It's like Axe five in one. It's like hair, armpits, legs, feet, all in, like, no way you can do all of that. Popular methods in the Old West were whiskey and castor oil. Yep, all on your big exposed head, right in the sun, there you go. Pantene Pro-V wasn't a thing then, so folks were rubbing their heads clean with castor oil. That's a nightmare. Whiskey was believed to help cleanse the scalp and often promote hair growth, while the castor oil, that option, that was thought to moisturize and condition the hair. So that'd be a fun two-in-one back then. That's great, put that in the stocking. These ingredients were readily available and most importantly, they were affordable, making them popular, but also, realistically, it was their only option. The guys doing whiskey, he's like, yeah, let's clean it up. Clean it up top. It's so hot. It's like, ugh, really burns. Number five, medical shows. Today, medical shows, they're fascinating. Dr. Pimple Popper, I'll watch that all day while I eat. I don't even care. I'm disgusting like that. Dude's getting mashed potatoes squeezed out of their back, so I'm like, ah, let's go. I love it. I'm slapping that thumbs up. It's my shit. Back in the Wild West, the 1860s, the 1890s, you know, they had what's called medicinal showmen. These are, what an absolute joke, what a con. These guys would go town to town selling elixirs and tonics, everything one needs to live a happy and comfortable Western life, but they were full of lies. None of this shit is true. These professional medicinal showmen would have pawns run ahead and plant themselves in the audience before these random demonstrations of amazing medical elixirs, right? These shows, a bunch of bullshit. They would call up random audience members, that guy that ran ahead, and then use one of these elixirs and magically treat their ailment on the spot in front of the public, right? Almost as if it was a magic show. One of the most successful of these elixirs was the elixir made from John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, roots, and animal fat, said to treat any and all illness. But in reality, it was just an extremely strong laxative. So yeah, if you're gonna take it, make sure you're close to home. 
Yeah. Number four, bad bartenders. When we think of old saloons, old West saloons with the swinging doors and stuff, a few catchphrases and a cowboy with some whiskey, all that good stuff. The bartender back then would pour a drink. The cowboy would take the bottle instead. So illegal. Sir, that's that. Please put that back. Back in the wild, wild Western days, grabbing a drink at the bar wasn't like that at all. It wasn't like anything you see in the movies. It sucked. Bartenders, they had no regulations to follow behind that dirty bar. But not only was it very high proof, but some bevies like tarantula juice was just, it would just poison you. It was literal poison. If its name didn't tip you off, it was literally made with poisonous ingredients. Cause that was, that's how cowboys did it back then. But they're, Paris. I don't know. Tarantula juice was made from strychnine. If you drink it, you're gonna feel like there's tarantulas crawling all over your skin. That was their pitch back then. They're like, eh, happy hour, come get tarantula juice. I'm like, awesome, thank you so much. How do I not tip? Which button do I press to not give you money, you freak? Number three, Bath and Body Works part two. Okay, another scenario. You're in the sixth grade. You're sitting at a desk and listening to Mrs. Smith and she's going over what today's art assignment is. As you begin to reach for your favorite shade of red crayon, an odor hits your nose. It's unlike anything you've ever smelled before. And it's coming from your armpit. Puberty induced body odor. Not to worry, your buddy has a can of the finest spray deodorant there is. He hands you a black can that says Axe. You are now one of them. And you start showing up to school dances with a seafoam pink button up shirt with the collar popped and a Justin Bieber haircut with a hat on backwards. Yeah, that's right. All while drenched in a can of Axe's finest. Shark tooth necklace shows every girl in the room that you're a tough guy. God, those guys are the worst. Okay, no, the Aztecs didn't go that far, but they were aware of the horrors of the classroom BO and recommended a special bath prepared with lovely smelling aromas, which makes sense. Good smells go in, bad smells from your bum, they go out. However, there's two ingredients that make me question things. Apparently, no odor killing bath is complete without a fresh bone from a dog and a human. I'm just gonna leave that with you and think about how you'd feel with two bones floating in your bath. That's disgusting. Apparently, they had to be fresh too. That's gross. Number two, outhouses. This one here stinks. In the Wild West, outhouses were sadly common as indoor plumbing was not yet available. Didn't think of that yet. So these structures were often simple and consisted of a small building, if you wanna call it that, with a hole in the ground for your Huh, your waste disposal, if you wanna call it that. Now, due to the unsanitary conditions and lack of proper waste management and knowledge and you know knowledge about germs and stuff, outhouses could attract a variety of insects and other pests, and it was just bad to go in there. Flies, mosquitoes, other bugs, they were commonly found in and around these structures, and they could potentially transmit diseases to humans. So, if you're in there, you really get your business done and then get out. You don't want to waste time. You're not checking any tweets while you're in there, that's for sure. Despite the unsanitary conditions of an outhouse, they were a necessary part of daily life in the Wild West. And people learned to tolerate the bugs and just deal with it because they're like, you know what? This is better than going on outside. Whatever's going on out there, we're good. Close that up. One time I went to a cottage when I was younger and my mom didn't tell me that they had only an outhouse. No running water the entire week. I was like, awesome, let's turn around, I guess. I'm not doing that. I held it for like seven days straight. It was a nightmare. And finally, number one, broken bones. I'm lucky enough to have never broken a bone. I mean, knock on all the woods. But what if you did back in the old Western days, right? Then what would happen? But is a cowboy gonna heal you up? No. What if you were trying to learn a kickflip and you broke your leg? Then what? What are you gonna do? If the dental plan was any indication, it's... It's not pretty, not a lot of options. In the Old West, broken bones were a common occurrence, particularly among those who worked in physically demanding jobs, like ranchers, miners, cowboys, around livestock. Those things kicking you randomly, something's gonna break. Treatment options were limited and often relied on first aid techniques, you know, splinting the affected area with whatever materials were available, such as wood, cloth, or even animal hides. It sounds crazy, but back then, that was really the only method for immobilizing broken bones. Pain relief, that was only provided with natural remedies, such as oak or willow bark tea, so. You're gonna feel that entire healing process. It's gonna suck. More serious fractures, like ones that, you know, go through the skin, those require the attention of a doctor or a surgeon. However, you know, those medical professionals back then were not always available in the remote areas of the Wild West. No helicopter's gonna come in and grab you and then take you out. No, it's, you're basically more often than not. Yeah.